snarling face began to ripple and stretch. No! One clutching, clawing arm stretched desperately out towards the first of the magi, fingertips straining. Yes, said Baez, the air around his smiling face trembling like the air above the desert. The nails tore from Mamun's fingers. His outstretched arm bent back, snapped, was ripped from his shoulder. Flawless skin peeled from bone, flapping like sailcloth in a squall, brown dust flying out of his torn body like a sandstorm over the dunes. He was dashed suddenly away, crashed through a wall near the top of one of the tall buildings. Blocks were sucked from the edges of the ragged hole he left and tumbled outwards, upwards. They joined the whipping paper, thrashing rock, spinning planks, flailing corpses that reeled through the air around the edge of the square, faster and faster, a circle of destruction that followed the iron circles on the ground. It reached now as high as the tall buildings, and now higher yet. It flayed and scoured at everything it passed, tearing up more stone, glass, wood, metal, flesh— growing darker, faster, louder, and more powerful with every moment. Over the mindless anger of the wind, Pharaoh could just hear Baez's voice. God smiles on results. Dogman got up and shook his sore head, dirt flying from his hair. There was blood running down his arm, red on white. Seemed as if the world hadn't ended after all. Looked like it had come close, though. Bridge and gatehouse both had disappeared. Where they'd stood, there was nothing but a great heap of broken stone and a yawning chasm carved out of the walls. That and a whole lot of dust. There were still some folk killing, but there were a lot more rolling about, choking and groaning, staggering through the rubbish, the fight all gone out of them. Dogman knew how they felt. Someone was clambering up onto that mass of junk where the moat used to be, heading towards the breach. Someone with a tangled mess of hair and a long sword in one hand. Who else but Logan Ninefingers? Ah, oh, shit, cursed Dogman. He'd got some damn fool ideas all of a sudden, had Logan, but that wasn't halfway the worst of it. There was someone following him across that bridge of rubble. Shivers, axe in hand, shield on arm, and a frown on his dirty face like a man with some dark work in mind. Oh, shit. Grim shrugged his dusty shoulders. Let's get after him. Aye. Dogman jerked his thumb at Red Hat, just getting up from the ground and shaking a pile of grit off his coat. Get some lads together, eh? He pointed off towards the breach with the blade of his sword. We're going that way. Damn it, but he needed to piss, just like always. Giselle backed away down the shadowy hall, hardly daring even to breathe, feeling the sweat prickle at his palms, at his neck, at the small of his back. What are they waiting for? Someone muttered. There was a gentle creaking sound above. Giselle looked up towards the black rafters. Did you hear? A shape burst through the ceiling and hurtled down into the hallway in a white blur, flattening one of the knights of the body, her feet leaving two great dents in his breastplate, blood spraying from his visor. She smiled up at Giselle. Greetings from the Prophet Kalul. The Union! roared another knight, charging forward. One moment his sword whistled towards her, the next she was on the other side of the corridor. The blade clanged harmlessly into the stone floor, and the man tottered forward. She seized him under the armpit, bent her knees slightly, and flung him shrieking through the ceiling. Broken plaster rained down as she grabbed another knight round the neck and smashed his head into the wall with such force that he was left embedded in the shattered stonework, armoured legs dangling. Antique swords tumbled from their brackets and clattered down into the hallway around his limp corpse. This way! 
The High Justice dragged Giselle, numb and helpless, towards a pair of gilded double doors. Gorst lifted up one heavy boot, gave them a shivering kick, and sent them flying open. They burst through into the Chamber of Mirrors, cleared of the many tables that had stood there on Giselle's wedding night, an empty acre of polished tiles. He ran for the far door, his slapping footfalls and his heaving, wheezing, horrified breath echoing out around the huge room. He saw himself running, distorted, in the mirrors far ahead of him, the mirrors to each side. A ludicrous sight, a clown king, fleeing through his own palace, crown askew, his scarred face beaded with sweat, slack with terror and exhaustion. He skidded to a halt almost fell over backwards in his haste to stop, Gorst nearly ploughing into his back. One of the twins was sitting on the floor beside the far doorway, leaning back against the mirrored wall, reflected in it, as though she were leaning against her sister. She lifted up one languorous hand, daubed crimson with blood, and she waved. Giselle spun towards the windows. Before he could even think of running, one of them burst into the room. The other twin came tumbling through in a shower of glittering glass, rolled over and over across the polished floor, unfolded to her feet, and slid to a stop. She ran one long hand through her golden hair, yawned, and smacked her lips. Have you ever had the feeling that someone else is having all the fun? she asked. Chapter 48 Reckonings Red Hat had been right. There was no reason for anyone to die here. No one but the Bloody Nine, at least. It was high time that bastard took his share of the blame. Still alive, Logan whispered. Still alive. He crept around the corner of a white building and into the park. He remembered this place full of people, laughing, eating, talking. There was no laughter here now. He saw bodies scattered on the lawns, some armoured, some not. He could hear a distant roar, far-off battle, maybe. Nothing nearer except the hissing of the wind through the bare branches and the crunching of his own footsteps in the gravel. His skin prickled as he crept towards the high wall of the palace. The heavy doors were gone, only the twisted hinges left hanging in the archway. The gardens on the other side were full of corpses, armoured men, all dented and bloody. There was a crowd of them on the path before the gate, crushed and broken, as though they'd been smashed with a giant hammer. One was sliced clean in half, the two pieces lying in a slick of dark blood. A man stood in the midst of all this. He had white armour on, speckled and dusted with red. A wind had blown up in the gardens, and his black hair flicked around his face, dark skin smooth and flawless as a baby's. He was frowning down at a body near his feet, but he looked up at Logan as he came through the gate. Without hatred or fear, without happiness or sadness, without anything much. You're a long way from home, he said in northern. You too. Logan looked into that empty face. You an eater? To that crime, I must confess. We're all guilty of something. Logan hefted his sword in one hand. Shall we get to it, then? I came here to kill Bias, no one else. Logan glanced round at the ruined corpses scattered across the gardens. How's that working out for you? Once you set your mind on killing, it is hard to choose the number of the dead. That is a fact. Blood gets you nothing but more blood, my father used to tell me. A wise man. If only I'd listened. It is hard sometimes to know what is the truth. The eater lifted up his bloody right hand and frowned at it. It is fitting that a righteous man should have doubts. You tell me. Can't say I know too many righteous men. I once thought I did. Now I'm not sure. We must fight? Logan took a long breath. Looks that way. So be it. 
He came so fast there was hardly time to lift a sword, let alone swing it. Logan threw himself out of the way, but still got caught in the ribs with something. Elbow, knee, shoulder. It can be hard to tell when you're flopping over and over on the grass, everything tumbling around you. He tried to get up, found that he couldn't. Raising his head an inch was almost more than he could manage. Every breath was painful. He dropped back, staring up at the white sky. Maybe he should have stayed outside the walls. Maybe he should have just let the lads rest in the trees until after it was all settled. The tall shape of the eater swam into his blurry vision, black against the clouds. I am sorry for this. I will pray for you. I will pray for us both. He lifted up his armoured foot. An axe chopped into his face and sent him staggering. Logan shook the light out of his head, dragged some air in. He forced himself up onto one elbow, clutching at his side. He saw a white-armoured fist flash down and crash onto Shiver's shield. It ripped a chunk out of the edge and knocked Shiver's onto his knees. An arrow pinged off the eater's shoulder plate, and he turned, one side of his head hanging bloodily open. A second shaft stuck him neatly through the neck. Grim and the dogman stood in the archway, their bows raised. The eater went pounding towards them with huge strides, the wind of his passing tearing at the grass. Huh? said Grim. The eater rammed into him with an armoured elbow. He crashed into a tree ten strides away and flopped down onto the grass. The eater raised its other arm to chop a dogman, and a carl stabbed a spear into him, carried him thrashing backwards. More Northmen charged through the gate, crowding round, screaming and shouting, hacking with axes and swords. Logan rolled over, crawled across the lawn, and seized hold of his sword, tearing a wet handful of grass up with it. A carl tumbled past him, broken head covered in blood. Logan squeezed his jaws together and charged, lifting his sword in both hands. It bit into the eater's shoulder, sheared through his armor, and split him open down as far as his chest, showering blood in the dogman's face. Same time, almost, one of the carls caught him full in the side with a maul, smashed his other arm, and left a great dent in his breastplate. The eater stumbled, and Red Hat hacked a gash in one of his legs. He lurched to his knees, blood spilling from his wounds and running down his dented white armor, pooling on the path underneath him. He was smiling, so far as Logan could tell, with half his face hanging off. Free, he whispered. Logan raised the maker's blade and hacked his head from his shoulders. A wind had blown up suddenly, swirling through the stained streets, hissing out of the burned-out buildings, whipping ash and dust in West's face as he rode towards the Agriont. He had to shout over it. How do we fare? The fight's gone out of them, bellowed Brint, his hair dragged sideways by another gust. They're in full retreat. Seems as if they were too keen to get the Agriont surrounded, and they weren't ready for us. Now they've fallen over each other to get away to the west. Still some fighting around Arnott's Wall, but Orso has them on the run in the three farms. West saw the familiar shape of the Tower of Chains over the top of a ruin, and he urged his horse towards it. Good. If we can just clear them away from the Agriont, we'll have the best of it. Then we can... He trailed off as they rounded the corner and could see all the way to the west gate of the Citadel. Or... More accurately, where the West Gate had once been. It took him a moment to make sense of it. The Tower of Chains loomed up to one side of a monumental breach in the wall of the Agriont. The entire gatehouse had somehow been brought down, along with large sections of the wall to either side, the remains choking the moat below or distributed widely around the ruined streets in front. The Gurkish were inside the Agriont. The very heart of the Union lay exposed. Not far ahead now, a formless battle was still raging before the Citadel. West urged his horse closer, through the stragglers and the wounded, into the very shadow of the walls. He saw a line of kneeling flatbow men deliver a withering volley into a crowd of Gurkish, bodies toppling. 
Beside him, a man screamed into the wind as another tried to secure a tourniquet on the bloody stump of his leg. Pike's face was grimmer even than usual. We should be further back, sir. This isn't safe. West ignored him. Each man had to do his part without exception. We need a line formed up here. Where is General Croy? The sergeant was no longer listening. His eyes had drifted upwards, his mouth dropping stupidly open. West turned around in his saddle. A black column was rising above the western end of the citadel. It seemed at first to be made of swirling smoke, but as West gained some sense of scale, he realized it was spinning matter. Masses of it. Countless tons of it. His eyes followed it upwards, higher and higher. The clouds themselves were moving, whipped round in a spiral at the centre, shifting in a slow circle above them. The fighting sputtered as Union and Gurkish alike gaped up at the writhing pillar above the Agriont, the Tower of Chains, a black finger in front of it, the House of the Maker, an insignificant pinprick behind. Things began to rain from the sky. Small things at first, splinters, dust, leaves, fragments of paper. Then a chunk of wood the size of a chair leg plummeted down and bounced spinning from the paving. A soldier squealed as a stone big as a fist smashed into his shoulder. Those who were not fighting were backing away, crouching to the ground, holding shields above their heads. The wind was growing more savage, clothes whipping in the storm, men stumbling against it, leaning into it, teeth gritted and eyes narrowed. The spinning pillar was growing wider, darker, faster, higher, touching the very sky. West could see specks around its edge dancing against the white clouds like swarms of midges on a summer's day except that these were tumbling blocks of stone, wood, earth, metal, by some freak of nature, sucked into the heavens and set flying. He did not know what was happening or how. All he could do was stare. Sir! bellowed Pike in his ear. Sir! We must go! He seized hold of West's bridle. A great chunk of masonry crashed into the paving not far from them. West's horse reared up, screaming in panic. The world lurched, spun, was black. He was not sure how long for. He was on his face, mouth full of grit. He raised his head, wobbled drunkenly up to his hands and knees, wind roaring in his ears, flying grit stinging at his face. It was dark as dusk. The air was full of tumbling rubbish. It ripped at the ground, at the buildings, at the men, huddled now like sheep, all sorts of battle long forgotten. The living sprawled on their faces with the dead. The Tower of Chains was scoured by debris, the slates flying from its rafters, then the rafters torn away into the storm. A giant beam plummeted down and crashed into the cobbles, spun end over end, flinging corpses out of its path to slice through the wall of a house and send its roof sliding inwards. West trembled, tears snatched away from his stinging eyes, utterly helpless. Was this how the end would come? Not covered in blood and glory at the head of a fool's charge like General Polder, not passing quietly in the night like Marshal Burr, not even hooded on the scaffold for the murder of Crown Prince Ladislaw, crushed at random by a giant piece of rubbish falling from the sky. Forgive me, he whispered into the tempest. He saw the black outline of the Tower of Chains shifting. He saw it lean outwards. Chunks of stone rained down, splashed into the churning moat. The whole vast edifice lurched, bulged, and toppled outwards with ludicrous slowness through the flailing storm and into the city. It broke into monstrous sections as it fell, crashing down upon the houses, crushing cowering men like ants, throwing deadly missiles in every direction. And that was all. There were no buildings now around the space that had once been the Square of Marshals. The gushing fountains, the stately statues in the Kingsway, the palaces full of soft pinks. 
all snatched away. The gilded dome had lifted from the Lord's round, cracked, split, and been ripped into chaff. The high wall of the hall's marshal was a ravaged ruin. The rest of the proud buildings were nothing more than shattered stumps, torn down to their very foundations. They had all melted away before Pharaoh's watering eyes, dissolved into the formless mass of fury that whirled shrieking around the first of the Magi, endlessly hungry from the ground to the very heavens. Yes! She could hear his delighted laughter over the noise of the storm. I am greater than Juvens! I am greater than Aeos himself! Was this vengeance? Then how much of it would make her whole? Pharaoh wondered dumbly how many people had been cowering in those vanished buildings. The shimmering around the seed was swelling up to her shoulder, then to her neck, and it engulfed her. The world grew quiet. Far away the destruction continued, but it was blurred now. The sounds of it came to her muffled as if through water. Her hand was beyond cold. She was numb to the shoulder. She saw Baez smiling, his arms raised. The wind ripped about them, a wall of endless movement. But there were shapes within it. They grew sharper even as the rest of the world grew less distinct. They gathered around the outside of the outermost circle. Shadows, ghosts, a hungry crowd of them. Pharaoh, came their whispering voices. A storm had blown up sudden in the gardens, more sudden even than the storms in the high places. The light had faded, then stuff had started tumbling down from the dark sky. Dogman didn't know where it was coming from, and he didn't much care. He had other things more pressing to worry on. They dragged the wounded in through a high doorway, groaning, cursing, or, worst of all, saying nothing. A couple they left outside, back to the mud already. No point wasting breath on them who were far past helping. Logan had Grimm under his armpits. The dogman had him by the boots. His face was white as chalk, but for the red blood on his lips. You could see it plain on his face that it was bad. But he didn't complain any, not hard in Grimm. Dogman wouldn't have believed it if he had. They set him down on the floor, in the gloom on the other side of the door. Dogman could hear things rattling against the windows, thumping against the turf outside, clattering on the roofs above. More men were carried in, broken arms and broken legs, and worse besides. Shivers came after, bloody axe in one hand and his shield arm dangling useless. Dogman had never seen a hallway like it. The floor was made of green stone and white stone, polished up smooth and shining bright as glass. The walls were hung with great paintings. The ceiling was crusted with flowers and leaves, carved so fine they looked almost real, except that they were made from gold, glittering in the dim light leaking through the windows. Men bent down, tending to fellows injured, giving them water and soft words, a splint or two being fixed. Logan and Shivers just stood there, giving each other a look. Not hatred, exactly, and not respect. It was hard for the dogman to say what it was, and he didn't much care about that either. What were you thinking? he snapped. Pissing off on your own like that. Thought you were supposed to be chief now. That's a poor effort, ain't it? Logan only stared back, eyes gleaming in the gloom. Gotta help Pharaoh, he muttered half to himself. Giselle, too. Dogman stared at him. Gotta help who? There's real folk here in need of help. I ain't much with the wounded. Only with the making of them. Go on, then, bloody nine, if you must. Get to it. Dogman saw Logan's face flinch when he heard that name. He backed away, one hand clamped to his side, and his sword gripped bloody in the other. Then he turned and limped off down the glittering hallway. Hurts, said Grimm, as Dogman squatted down next to him. Where? 
He gave a bloody smile. Everywhere? Right, well, Dogman pulled his shirt up. One side of his chest was caved in. A great blue-black bruise spread out all across it like a tar stain. He could hardly believe a man could still be breathing with a wound like that. Ah, <sighs> he muttered, not having a clue where to start even. I think I'm done. What, this? Dogman tried to grin, but didn't have it in him. No more than a scratch. Scratch, he... Grim tried to lift his head, winced and fell back, breathing shallow. He stared up, eyes wide open. That's a fucking beautiful ceiling. The dog man swallowed. I, I reckon. Should have died fight nine fingers long time ago. Rest was all a gift. Grateful for it, though, dog man. I've always loved our talks. He closed his eyes and he stopped breathing. He'd never said much, Harding Grimm, famous for it. Now he'd stay silent forever. A pointless sort of a death, a long way from home. Not for anything he'd believed in or understood or stood to gain from. Nothing more than a waste. But then Dogman had seen a lot of men go back to the mud, and there was never anything fine about it. He took a long breath and stared down at the floor. A single lamp cast creeping shadows across the mouldering hallway over rough stone and flaking plaster. It made sinister outlines of the mercenaries, turned Koska's face and Ardy's into unfamiliar masks. The darkness seemed to gather inside the heavy stonework of the archway and around the door within, ancient-looking, knotted and grained, studded with black iron rivets. Something amusing, Superior? I stood here, murmured Glockter, in this exact spot with silver. He reached out and brushed the iron handle with his fingertips. My hand was on the ledge, and I moved on. Ah, the irony, the answers we seek so long and far for, so often at our fingertips all along. Glockter felt a shiver down his twisted spine as he leaned close to the door. He could hear something from beyond, a muffled droning in a language he did not recognize. The Adeptus Demonic calls upon the denizens of the Abyss. He licked his lips, the image of High Justice Morovia's frozen remains fresh in his mind. It would be rash to plunge straight through, however keen we are to put our questions to rest. Very rash. Superior Goyle, since you have led us here, perhaps you would care to go first? <coughs> squeaked Goyle through his gag, his already bulging eyes going even wider. Koska took the superior of Adua by his collar, seized the iron handle with his other hand, thrust it swiftly open, and applied his boot to the seat of Goyle's trousers. He stumbled through, bellowing meaningless nonsense into his gag. The metallic sound of a flatbow being discharged issued from the other side of the door, along with the chanting, louder and harsher now by far. What would Colonel Glockter have said? Onwards to victory, lads. Glockter lurched through the doorway, almost tripping over his own aching foot on the threshold, and gazed about him in surprise. A large, circular hall with a domed ceiling, its shadowy walls painted with a vast, exquisitely detailed mural. And one that seems uncomfortably familiar. Canadius, the master maker, loomed up over the chamber with arms outspread, five times life-size or more, fire blazing from behind him in vivid crimson, orange, white. On the opposite wall lay his brother Juvens, stretched out on the grass beneath flowering trees, blood running from his many wounds. In between the two men, the Magi marched to take their revenge, 
six on one side, five on the other, bald buyers in the lead. Blood, fire, death, vengeance. How wonderfully appropriate, given the circumstances. An intricate design had been laid out with obsessive care, covering wide floor. Circles within circles, shapes, symbols, figures of frightening complexity, all described in neat lines of white powder. Salt, unless I am much mistaken. Goyle lay on his chest a stride or two from the door, at the edge of the outermost ring, his hands still tied behind him. Dark blood spread out from under him, the point of a flatbow bolt sticking out of his back. Just where his heart should be. I would never have taken that for his weak spot. Four of the university's adepti stood in various stages of amazement. Three of them, Chael, Denker, and Candelau, held candles in both hands, their sputtering wicks giving off a choking corpse stink. Saurazin, the adeptus chemical, clutched an empty flatbow. The faces of the old men, lit in bilious yellow from beneath, were pantomime masks of fear. At the far side of the room, Silver stood behind a lectern, a great book open before him, staring down with intense concentration by the light of a single lamp. His finger hissed across the page, his thin lips moving ceaselessly. Even at this distance, and despite the fact the room was icy cold, Glockter could see fat beads of sweat running down his thin face. Beside him, painfully upright in his pure white coat and glaring blue daggers across the width of the chamber, stood Archlector Salt. Glockter, you crippled bastard! he snarled. What the hell are you doing here? I could well ask you the same question, Your Eminence. He waved his cane at the scene. Except the candles, the ancient books, the chanting and the circles of salt rather give the game away, no? And a rather infantile game, it seems, suddenly. All that time, while I was torturing my way through the Mercers, while I was risking my life in Dagoska, while I was blackmailing votes in your name, you were up to... this? but Salt seemed to be taking it seriously enough. Get out, you fool! This is our last chance! This? Seriously? Koska was already through the door, masked mercenaries following. Silver's eyes were still fixed on the book, lips still moving, more sweat on his face than ever. Glockter frowned. Someone shut him up! No! shouted Chael, a look of utter horror on his tiny face. You mustn't stop the incantations! It is a profoundly dangerous operation! The consequences could be... could be... disastrous! shrieked Candelau. One of the mercenaries took a step towards the middle of the room, nonetheless. Don't tread near the salt! screeched Denka, wax dripping from his wobbling candle. Whatever you do! Wait! snapped Glockter, and the man paused at the edge of the circle, peering at him over his mask. The room was growing colder even as they spoke, unnaturally cold. Something was happening in the center of the circles. The air was trembling, like the air above a bonfire, more and more, as Silber's harsh voice droned on. Glockter stood frozen, his eyes flicking between the old adepti. What to do? Stop him or don't stop him? Stop him or... Allow me! Koska stepped forwards, delving into his black coat with his spare left hand. But you can't be... He whipped his arm out with a careless flourish, and his throwing knife came with it. The blade flashed in the candlelight, spun directly through the shimmering air in the center of the room, and embedded itself to the hilt in Silver's forehead with a gentle thud. Ha! Koska seized Glockter by the shoulder. What did I tell you? Have you ever seen a knife thrown better? Blood ran down the side of Silber's face in a red trickle. His eyes rolled upwards, flickered, then he sagged sideways, dragging over his lectern and crashed to the floor. His book tumbled down on top of him, aged pages flapping. The lamp spilled over and sprayed streaks of burning oil across the floor. 
No! shrieked Salt. Chael gasped, his mouth falling open. Candelau threw his candle aside and sank groveling to the floor. Denka gave a terrified squeak, one hand over his face, staring out pop-eyed from between his fingers. There was a long pause while everyone except Koska stared, horrified, towards the corpse of the Adeptus demonic. Glockter waited, his few teeth bared, his eyes almost squeezed shut. Like that horrible, beautiful moment between stubbing your toe and feeling the hurt. Here it comes, here it comes, here comes the pain. But nothing came. No demonic laughter echoed through the chamber. The floor did not fall in to expose a gate to hell. The shimmering faded. The room began to grow warmer. Glockter raised his brows, almost disappointed. It would seem the diabolical arts are decidedly overrated. No! snarled Salt again. I am afraid so, your eminence. And to think, I used to respect you. Glockter grinned at the Adeptus chemical, still clinging weakly to his empty flatbow. He waved a hand at Goyle's body. A good shot. I congratulate you. One less mess for me to tidy up. He waved a finger at the crowd of mercenaries behind him. Now seize that man. No! bellowed Sarazin, throwing his flatbow to the floor. None of it was my idea! I had no choice! It was him! He stabbed a thick finger at Silver's lifeless body. And... and him! He pointed to Salt with a trembling arm. You've got the right idea, but it can wait for the interrogation. Would you be kind enough to take his eminence into custody? Happily. Koska strolled across the floor of the wide room, his boots sending up puffs of white powder, leaving a trail of ruination through the intricate patterns. Clock, hey, you blundering idiot! shrieked Salt. You have no idea of the danger Baez poses! This first of the Magi and his bastard king! Glockter, you have no right! Glock! He yelped as Koska dragged his arms behind his back and forced him to his knees, his white hair in disarray. You have no idea! If the Gurkish don't kill the lot of us, you'll get ample time to explain it to me. Of that, I assure you. Glockter leered his toothless smile as Koska drew the rope tight around Salt's wrists. If you only knew how long I have dreamed of saying these words. Archlector Salt, I arrest you for high treason against His Majesty the King. Giselle could only stand and stare. One of the twins, the one spattered in blood, lifted her long arms slowly over her head and gave a long, satisfied stretch. The other raised an eyebrow. How would you like to die? she asked. Your Majesty, get behind me! Gorst hefted his long steel in his one good hand. No, not this time. Giselle pulled the crown from his head, the crown that Baez had been so particular in designing, and tossed it clattering away. He was done with being a king. If he was to die, he would die a man like any other. He had been given so many advantages, he realized now, far more than most men could ever dream of. So many chances to do good. And he had done nothing besides whine and think of himself. Now it was too late. I've lived my life leaning on others, hiding behind them, climbing on their shoulders. Not this time. One of the twins raised her hands and started slowly to clap, the regular tap, tap echoing from the mirrors. The other giggled. Gorst raised his sword. Giselle did the same, one last act of pointless defiance. Then High Justice Morovia flashed between them. The old man moved with impossible speed, his dark robe snapping around him. He had something in his hand, a long rod of dark metal with a hook on the end. What? muttered Giselle. 
The hook blazed suddenly, searingly white, bright as the sun on a summer's day. A hundred hooks burned like stars, reflected back from the mirrors round the walls, and back and back into the far distance. Giselle gasped, squeezed his eyes shut, holding one hand over his face. The long trail left by that brilliant point burned fizzing into his vision. He blinked, gaped, lowered his arm. The twins stood, the high justice beside them, just where they had before, still as statues. Tendrils of white steam hissed up from vents in the end of the strange weapon and curled around Morovia's arm. For a moment, nothing moved. Then a dozen of the great mirrors at the far end of the hall fell in half across the middle, as though they were sheets of paper slashed suddenly by the world's sharpest knife. A couple of the bottom halves and one of the top toppled slowly forwards into the room and shattered, scattering bright fragments of glass across the tiled floor. <coughs> breathed the twin on the left. Giselle realized that blood was spurting out from under her armor. She lifted one hand towards him, and it dropped off the end of her arm and thudded to the tiles, blood squirting from the smoothly severed stump. She toppled to the left, or her body did at least. Her legs fell the other way. The bigger part of her crashed to the ground, and her head came off and rolled across the tiles in a widening pool. Her hair, trimmed off cleanly at the neck, fluttered down into the bloody mess in a golden cloud. Armor, flesh, bone, all divided into neat sections as perfectly as cheese by a cheese wire. The twin on the right frowned, took a wobbling step towards Morovia. Her knees gave out, and she fell in half at the waist. The legs slumped down and lay still, dust sliding out in a brown heap. The top half dragged itself forward by the nails, lifted its head, hissing. The air around the High Justice shimmered, and the Eater's severed body burst into flames. It thrashed for a while, making a long squealing sound. Then it was still, a mass of smoking black ash. Morovia lifted up the strange weapon, whistling softly as he smiled at the hook on the end, a last few traces of vapor still drifting from it. Canadius, he certainly knew how to make a weapon. The Master Maker indeed, eh, Your Majesty? What? muttered Giselle, utterly dumbfounded. Morovia's face melted slowly away as he crossed the floor towards them. Another began to show itself beneath, only his eyes remained the same. Different coloured eyes, happy lines around the corners, grinning at Giselle like an old friend. Yoru Sulfur bowed. Never any peace, eh, your majesty? Never the slightest peace. There was a crash as one of the doors burst open. Giselle raised his sword, heart in his mouth. Sulphur whipped round, the maker's weapon held down by his side. A man stumbled into the room, a big man, his grimacing face covered in scars, his chest heaving, a heavy sword hanging from one hand, the other clutched to his ribs. Giselle blinked, hardly able to believe it. Logan Ninefingers! How the hell did you get here? The Northman stared for a moment, then he leaned back against a mirror by the door, let his sword drop to the tiles. He slid down slowly until he hit the floor, and sat there with his head leaning back against the glass. Long story, he said. Listen to us. The wind was full of shapes now, hundreds of them. They crowded in around the outermost circle, the bright iron turned misty, gleaming with cold wet. We have things to tell you, Pharaoh. Secrets. What can we give you? We know everything. You need only let us in. So many voices. She heard Aruf among them, her old teacher. She heard Susman the slaver. She heard her mother and her father. She heard Yulwe and Prince Uthman. A hundred voices, a thousand. Voices she knew and had forgotten. Voices of the dead and of the living. Shouts, mutters, screams, whispers in her ear, 
closer still, closer than her own thoughts. You want vengeance? We can give you vengeance. Like nothing you have dreamed of. All you want, all you need. Only let us in. That empty space in you. We are what is missing. The metal rings had turned white with frost. Pharaoh kneeled at one end of a dizzying tunnel, its walls made from rushing, roaring, furious matter, full of shadows, its end far beyond the dark sky. The laughter of the first of the Magi echoed faintly in her ears. The air hummed with power, twisted, shimmered, blurred. You need do nothing, Bias. He will do it. Fool. Liar! Let us in. He cannot understand. He uses you. He laughs. But not for long. The gates strain. Let us in. If Baez heard the voices, he gave no sign. Cracks ran through the quivering paving, branching out from his feet, splinters floating up around him in whirling spirals. The iron rings began to shift, to buckle. With a grinding of tortured metal, they twisted out from the crumbling stones, bright edges shining. The seals break. Eleven wards. And eleven wards reversed. The doors open. Yes, came the voices speaking together. The shadows crowded in closer. Pharaoh's breath came short and fast. Her teeth rattled. Her limbs trembled. The cold was on her very heart. She knelt at a precipice, bottomless, limitless, full of shadows, full of voices. Soon we will be with you. Very soon. The time is upon us. Both sides of the divide joined, as they were meant to be, before Aeos spoke his first law. Let us in. She needed only to cling to the seed a moment longer. Then the voices would give her vengeance. Baez was a liar. She had known it from the start. She owed him nothing. Her eyelids flickered, closed, her mouth hung open. The noise of the wind grew fainter yet until she could hear only the voices. Whispering, soothing, righteous. We will take the world and make it right. Together. Let us in. You will help us. You will free us. You can trust us. Trust us. Trust. A word that only liars used. Pharaoh remembered the wreckage of Alcus, the hollow ruins, the blasted mud. The creatures of the other side are made of lies. Better to have an empty space in her than to fill it with this. She wedged her tongue between her teeth and bit down hard, felt her mouth fill up with salty blood. She sucked in breath, forced her eyes open. Trust us. Let us in. She saw the maker's box, a shifting, swimming outline. She bent down over it, digging at it with her numb fingertips while the air lashed at her. She would be no one's slave. Not for buyers, not for the tellers of secrets. She would find her own path. A dark one, perhaps, but her own. The lid swung open. No! The voices hissed together in her ear. No! Pharaoh ground her bloody teeth, growled with fury as she forced her fingers to unclench. The world was a melting, screaming, formless mass of darkness. Gradually, gradually, her dead hand came open. Here was her revenge, against the liars, the users, the thieves. The earth shook, crumbled, tore, as thin and fragile as a sheet of glass, and with an empty void beneath it. She turned her trembling hand, and the seed dropped from her palm. All as one, the voices screamed their harsh command. Now! She blindly seized hold of the lid. Fuck yourselves! She hissed. And with her last grain of strength, she forced the box closed. Chapter 49 After the Rains Logan leaned on the parapet, high up on a tower at one side of the palace, and frowned into the wind. He'd done the same, it felt an age ago now, from the top of the Tower of Chains. 
He'd stared out dumbstruck at the endless city, wondering if he could ever have dreamed of a man-made thing so proud and beautiful and indestructible as the Agriont. By the dead, how times change. The green space of the park was scattered with fallen rubbish, trees broken, grass gouged, half the lake leaked away and sunken to a muddy bog. At its western edge, a sweep of fine white buildings still stood, even if the windows gaped empty. Further west, and they had no roofs, bare rafters hanging. Further still, their walls were torn and scoured, empty shells choked with rubble. Beyond that, there was nothing. The great hall with the golden dome, gone. The square where Logan had watched the sword game, gone. The Tower of Chains, the mighty wall under it, and all the grand buildings over which Logan had fled with Pharaoh, all gone. A colossal circle of destruction was carved from the western end of the Agriant, and only acres of formless wreckage remained. The city beyond was torn with black scars, smoke still rising from a few last fires, from smouldering hulks still drifting in the bay. The house of the Maker loomed over the scene, a sharp black mass under the brooding clouds, uncaring and untouched. Logan stood there, scratching at the scarred side of his face over and over. His wounds ached, so many of them. Every part of him was battered and bruised, slashed and torn. From the fight with the Eater, from the battle beyond the moat, from the duel with the feared— from seven days of slaughter in the high places, from a hundred fights and skirmishes and old campaigns, too many to remember, so tired and sore and sick. He frowned down at his hands on the parapet in front of him. The bare stone looked back where his middle finger used to be. He was nine fingers still, the bloody nine, a man made of death just as Bethod had said. He'd nearly killed the dogman yesterday, he knew it. His oldest friend, his only friend. He'd raised the sword, and if it wasn't for a trick of fate, he would have done it. He remembered standing high up on the side of the great northern library, looking out over the empty valley, the still lake like a great mirror beneath it. He remembered feeling the wind on his fresh-shaved jaw, and wondering whether a man could change. Now he knew the answer. Master Ninefingers! Logan turned quickly, hissed through his teeth as the stitches down his side burned. The first of the Magi stepped through the doorway and out into the open air. He was changed somehow. He looked younger, younger even than when Logan first met him. There was a sharpness to his movements a gleam in his eye. It even seemed that there were a few dark hairs in the grey beard round his friendly grin. The first smile Logan had seen in a good while. You are hurt? he asked. Logan sucked sourly at his teeth. Hardly the first time. And yet it gets no easier. Byers placed his meaty fists on the stone next to Logan's and stared out happily at the view just as if it was a field of flowers instead of a sweep of epic ruin. I hardly expected to see you again so soon, and to see you so very far advanced. I understand that your feud is over. You defeated Bethard, threw him from his own walls, the way I heard it. A nice touch, always thinking of the song they will sing, eh? And then you took his place. The Bloody Nine, King of the Northmen, imagine that! Logan frowned. That wasn't how it happened. Details. The result is the same, is it not? Peace in the North at last? Either way, I congratulate you. Bethod had a few things to say. Did he? asked Byers carelessly. I always found his conversation rather drab. All about himself, his plans, his achievements. It is so very tiresome when men think never of others— Poor manners. He said, you're the reason why he didn't kill me. 
that you bargained for my life. True, I must confess. He owed me, and you were the price I demanded. I like to keep one eye on the future. Even then I knew I might have need of a man who could speak to the spirits. It was an unexpected bonus that you turned out to be such a winning travelling companion. Logan found he was talking through gritted teeth. Would have been nice to know is all. You never asked, Master Nine Fingers. You did not want to know my plans, as I recall, and I did not want to make you feel indebted. I saved your life once would have been a poor start to our friendship. All reasonable enough, like everything Baez ever said— but it left a sour taste still to have been traded like a hog. Where's Kwai? I'd like to— Dead! Byers pronounced the word smartly, sharp as a knife thrust. We feel his loss most keenly. Back to the mud, eh? Logan remembered the effort he'd made to save that man's life, the miles he'd slogged through the rain trying to do the right thing, all wasted. Perhaps he should have felt more, but it was hard with so much death spread out in front of him. Logan was numb now. Either that, or he really didn't care a shit. It was hard to say which. Back to the mud, he muttered again. You carry on, though, don't you? Of course. That's the task that comes with surviving. You remember them, you say some words. Then you carry on and hope for better. Indeed. You have to be realistic about these things. True. Logan worked at his sore side with one hand, trying to make himself feel something. But a scrap of extra pain helped no one. I lost a friend yesterday. It was a bloody day, but a victorious one. Oh, I. For who? He could see people moving among the ruins, insects picking at the rubble, searching for survivors and finding the dead. He doubted many of them were feeling the flush of victory right now. He knew he wasn't. I should be with my own kind, he muttered, but without moving. Helping with the burying. Helping with the wounded. And yet you are here, looking down. Baez's green eyes were hard as stones. That hardness that Logan had noticed from the very start and had somehow forgotten, somehow grown to overlook. I entirely understand your feelings. Healing is for the young. As one gets older, one finds one has less and less patience with the wounded. He raised his eyebrows as he turned back towards the horrible view. I am very old. He lifted his fist to knock, then paused, fingers rubbing nervously against his palm. He remembered the sour, sweet smell of her, the strength of her hands, the shape of her frown in the firelight. He remembered the warmth of her, pressed up close to him in the night. He knew there had been something good between them, even if all the words they had said had been hard. Some people don't have soft words in them, however much they try. He didn't hold much hope, of course. A man like him was better off without it. But you get nothing out if you put nothing in. So Logan gritted his teeth and knocked. No reply. He chewed at his lip and knocked again. Nothing. He frowned. Twitchy and suddenly out of patience, wrenched the knob round and shoved the door open. Pharaoh spun about. Her clothes were rumpled and dirty, even more than usual. Her eyes were wide, wild even, her fists clenched. But her face quickly fell when she saw it was him, and his heart sank with it. It's me, Logan. Huh, she grunted. She jerked her head sideways, frowning at the window. She took a couple of steps towards it, eyes narrowed. Then she snapped round suddenly the other way. There! What? muttered Logan, baffled. Do you not hear them? Hear what? Them, idiot! 
she crept over to one wall and pressed herself up against it. Logan hadn't been sure how it would go. You could never be sure of anything with her, he knew that. But he hadn't been expecting this. Just plow ahead, he reckoned. What else could he do? I'm a king now, he snorted. King of the Norsemen, would you believe it? He was thinking she'd laugh in his face, but she just stood listening to the wall. Me and Lothar both. A pair of kings. Can you think of two more worthless bastards to put crowns on, eh? No answer. Logan licked his lips. No choice but to get straight to it, maybe. Pharaoh, the way things turned out, the way we left it. He took a step towards her and another. I wish I hadn't... I don't know. He put one hand on her shoulder. Pharaoh, I'm trying to tell you. She turned quickly, plastered her hand over his mouth. She grabbed his shirt and pulled him down, down onto his knees. She pressed her ear against the tiles, eyes moving back and forward as if she was listening for something. Do you hear that? She let go of him and pushed herself into the corner. There! Do you hear them? He reached out slowly and touched the back of her neck, ran his rough fingertips over her skin. She shook him off with a jerk of her shoulders, and he felt his face twist. Perhaps that good thing between them had been only in his mind and never in hers. Perhaps he had wanted it so badly he had let himself imagine it. He stood up, cleared his dry throat. Never mind. I'll come back later, maybe. She was still on her knees, her head against the floor. She did not even watch him leave. Logan Ninefingers was no stranger to death. He'd walked among it all his days. He'd watched the bodies burned by the score after the battle at Carleon long ago. He'd seen them buried by the hundred up in the nameless valley in the high places. He'd walked on a hill of men's bones under ruined Alcus. But even the Bloody Nine, even the most feared man in the north— had never looked on anything like this. Bodies were stacked beside the wide avenue in heaps chest high, sagging mounds of corpses on and on, hundreds upon hundreds, too many for him to guess at the numbers. Someone had made an effort at covering them, but not that great an effort. The dead give no thanks for it, after all. Ragged sheets flapped in the breeze, weighted down with broken wood, limp hands and feet hanging out from underneath. At this end of the road a few statues still stood, once proud kings and their advisers, stone faces and bodies scarred and pitted, stared sadly down at the bloody waste heaped round their feet. Enough of them for Logan to recognize that this truly was the king's way, and that he hadn't somehow stumbled into the land of the dead. A hundred strides further, and there were only empty plinths, one with broken legs still attached. A strange group were clustered around them, withered-looking, somewhere between dead and alive. A man sat on a block of stone, staring numbly as he pulled handfuls of hair out of his head. Another was coughing into a bloody rag. A woman and a man lay side by side, gawping at nothing, faces shriveled to little more than skulls. Her breath came crackling short and fast. His did not come at all. Another hundred strides, and it was as if Logan walked through some ruined hell. There was no sign that statues, buildings, or anything else had ever stood there. In their place were only tangled hills of strange rubbish. Broken stone, splintered wood, twisted metal, paper, glass, all crushed together and bound up with tons of dust and mud. Things stuck from the wreckage, strangely intact. A door, a chair, a carpet, a painted plate, the smiling face of a statue. 
Men and women struggled everywhere among this chaos, streaked with dirt, picking at the rubbish, throwing it down to the road, trying to clear paths through it. Rescuers, workmen, thieves, who knew? Logan passed by a crackling bonfire, high as a man, felt the kiss of its heat on his cheek. A big soldier in armor, stained with black soot, stood beside it. You find anything in white metal? He was roaring at the searchers. Anything at all? It goes in the fire. Flesh in white metal? Burn it. Orders of the closed council. A few strides further on, someone was on top of one of the highest mounds, straining at a great length of wood. He turned round to get a better grip. None other than Giselle Dan Luther. His clothes were torn and grubby, his face was smudged with mud. He barely looked any more like a king than Logan did. A thick-set man stood staring up, one arm in a sling. Your Majesty, this is not safe, he piped in an oddly girlish voice. We really should be... No, this is where I'm needed. Giselle bent back over the beam, straining at it, veins bulging from his neck. There was no way he was going to get it shifted on his own, but still he tried. Logan stood watching him. How long's he been like this? All night and all day, said the thick-set man, and no sign of stopping. Those few we found alive, nearly all of them have this sickness. He waved his good arm towards the pitiful group beside the statues. Their hair falls out, their nails, their teeth, they wither. Some have died already. Others are well on the way. He slowly shook his head. What crime did we commit to deserve this punishment? Punishment doesn't always come to the guilty. Nine fingers! Giselle was looking down, the watery sun behind him. There's a strong back. Grab the end of that beam there. It was hard to see what good shifting a beam might do in all of this. But great journeys start with small steps, Logan's father had always told him. So he clambered up, wood cracking and stone sliding underneath his boots, hauled himself to the top and stood there, staring. By the dead. From where he was standing, the hills of wreckage seemed to go on forever. People crawled over them, dragging frantically at the rubble, sorting carefully through it, or simply standing like him, stunned by the scale of it. A circle of utter waste, a mile across or more. Help me, Logan! Aye, right. He bent down and dug his hands under one end of the great length of scarred wood. Two kings dragging at a beam, the kings of mud. Pull, then! Logan heaved, his stitches burning. Gradually, he felt the wood shift. Yes, grunted Giselle through gritted teeth. Together, they lifted it, hauled it to one side. Giselle reached down and dragged away a dry tree branch, tore back a ripped sheet. A woman lay beneath, staring sideways. One broken arm was wrapped around a child, curly hair dark with blood. All right. Giselle wiped slowly at his mouth with the back of one dirty hand. All right. Well, we'll put them with the rest of the dead. He clambered further over the wreckage. You! Bring that crowbar up here! Up here! And a pick! We need to clear this stone! Stack it there! We'll need it later to rebuild! Logan put a hand on his shoulder. Giselle, wait. Wait! You know me. Of course, I like to think so. All right. Tell me something, then. Am I... He struggled to find the right words. Am I... an evil man? You? Giselle stared at him, confused. You're the best man I know. They were gathered under a broken tree in the park, a shadowy crowd of them. Black outlines of men, standing calm and still, 
red clouds and golden spread out above, around the setting sun. Logan could hear their slow voices as he walked up. Words for the dead, soft and sad. He could see the graves at their feet. Two dozen piles of fresh-turned earth set out in a circle so each man was equal. The great leveller, just as the hillmen say. Men put in the mud and men saying words. Could have been a scene out of the old north long ago in the time of Scarling Hoodless. Hard ain't grim. I never saw a better man with a bow. Not ever. Can't count the number of times he saved my life. I never expected thanks for it. Except maybe that I'd do the same for him. Guess I couldn't this time. Guess none of us could. The dogman's voice trailed off. A few heads turned to look at Logan as his footsteps crunched in the gravel. If it ain't the King of the Northmen, someone said. The bloody nine itself. We should bow, shouldn't we? They were all looking at him now. He could see their eyes gleaming in the dusk. Nothing more than shaggy outlines, hard to tell one man from another. A crowd of shadows, a crowd of ghosts, and just as unfriendly. You got something you want to say, bloody nine? came a voice from near the back. I don't reckon, he said. You're doing all right. There's no reason for us to be here. A few mumbles of agreement. Not our bloody fight. No need for them to have died. More mutters. Should be you we're burying. Aye. Maybe. Logan would have liked to weep at that, but instead he felt himself smiling. The bloody nine smile. That grin that skulls have, with nothing inside but death. Maybe. But you don't get to pick who dies. Not unless you've got the bones to put your own hand to it. Have you? Have any of you? Silence. Well then. Good for Harding Grimm. Good for the rest of the dead. They'll all be missed. Logan spat onto the grass. Shit on the rest of you. And he turned and walked back the way he came, into the darkness. Chapter 50 Answers So much to do. The house of questions still stood, and someone had to take the reins. Who else will do it? Superior Goyle? A flatbow bolt through the heart prevents him, alas. Someone had to look to the internment and questioning of the many hundreds of Gurkish prisoners, more captured every day as the army drove the invaders back to Keln. And who else will do it? Practical Vitari left the Union forever with her children in tow. Someone had to examine the treason of Lord Brock to dig him up and root out his accomplices, to make arrests and obtain confessions. And who else is there now? Archlector Salt? Oh, dear me, no. Glockter wheezed up to his door, his few teeth bared at the endless pains in his legs. A fortunate decision, at least, to move to the eastern side of the Agriont. One should be grateful for the small things in life— like a place to rest one's crippled husk. My old lodgings are no doubt languishing under a thousand tons of rubble, just like the rest of... His door was not quite shut. He gave it the gentlest of pushes, and it creaked open, soft lamplight spilling out into the corridor, a glowing stripe over the dusty floorboards, over the foot of Glockter's cane, and the muddy toe of one boot. I left no door unlocked, and certainly no lamps burning. His tongue slithered nervously over his empty gums. A visitor, then, an uninvited one. Do I go in and welcome them to my rooms? His eyes slid sideways into the shadows of the corridor. Or do I make a run for it? He was almost smiling as he shuffled over the threshold, cane first, then the right foot, then the left, dragging painfully behind him. 
Doctor's guest sat by the window in the light of a single lamp. Brightness splashed across the hard plains of his face. Cold darkness gathered in the deep hollows. The square's board was set before him, just as Glockter left it, the pieces casting long shadows across the checkered wood. Why, superior Glockter, I have been waiting for you. And I for you. Glockter limped over to the table, his cane scraping against the bare boards. As reluctantly as a man limping to the gallows. Ah, well... No one tricks the hangman forever. Perhaps we'll have some answers, at least before the end. I always dreamed of dying well-informed. Slowly, ever so slowly, he lowered himself, grunting into the free chair. Do I have the pleasure of addressing Master Valent or Master Bulk? Baez smiled. Both! Of course. Glockter wrapped his tongue round one of his few remaining teeth and dragged it away with a faint sucking sound. And to what do I owe the overpowering honour? I said, did I not, that day we visited the Maker's House that we should have a talk at some point? A talk about what I want and about what you want. That point has come. Oh. Joyous day. The first of the Magi watched him, the same look in his bright eyes that a man might have while watching an interesting beetle. I must admit you fascinate me, Superior. Your life would seem to be entirely unbearable, and yet you fight so very, very hard to stay alive, with every weapon and stratagem. You simply refuse to die. I am ready to die. Glockter returned his gaze, like for like. But I refuse to lose. Whatever the cost, eh? We are two of a kind, you and I. And we are a rare kind indeed. We understand what must be done. And we do not flinch from doing it, regardless of sentiment. You remember Lord Chancellor Feekt, of course. If I cast my mind a long way back. The Golden Chancellor? They say he ran the Clothed Council for forty years. They say he ran the Union. Salt said so. Salt said his death left a hole into which he and Morovia were both keen to step. That is where this ugly dance began for me, with a visit from the Archlector with the confession of my old friend Salem Ruse, with the arrest of Sep Dan Teufel, master of the mints. Baez let one thick fingertip trail across the pieces on the squares board, as though considering his next move. We had an agreement, Feet and I. I made him powerful. He served me utterly. Feet, the foundation on which the nation rested, served you? I expected delusions of grandeur, but this will take some beating. You would have me suppose that you controlled the Union all that time? Byers snorted. Ever since I forced the damn thing together in the time of Harold the Great, so called. It has sometimes been necessary for me to take a hand myself, as in this most recent crisis. But mostly I have stood at a distance behind the curtain, as it were. A little stuffy back there, one imagines. An uncomfortable necessity. The lamplight gleamed on the Magus's white grin. People like to watch the pretty puppets, Superior. Even a glimpse of the puppeteer can be most upsetting for them. Why? They might even suddenly notice the strings around their own wrists. Salt caught a glimpse of something, behind the curtain, and only look at the trouble he caused for everyone. Byers flicked one of the pieces over, and it clattered onto its side, rocked gently back and forth. Let us suppose you are indeed the great architect, and you have given us... 
Glockter waved his hand towards the window. Acres of charming devastation. All this? Why such generosity? Not entirely selfless, I must confess. Kalul had the Gurkish to fight for him. I needed soldiers of my own. Even the greatest of generals needs little men to hold the line. He absently nudged one of the smallest pieces forward. Even the greatest of warriors needs his armor. Glockter stuck out his bottom lip. But then feet died and you were left naked. Naked as a babe at my age. Baez gave a long sigh. And in poor weather, too, with Kalul making ready for war. I should have arranged a suitable successor more quickly, but my thoughts were elsewhere, deep in my books. The older you get, the more swiftly the years pass. It's easy to forget how quickly people die. And how easily. The death of the Golden Chancellor left a vacuum muttered Glockter, thinking it through. Salt and Morovia saw a chance to take power for themselves and advance their own notions of what the nation should be. Exceptionally cockeyed notions, as it happens. Salt wanted to return to an imaginary past where everyone kept their place and always did as they were told. And Morovia... <laughs> Morovia wanted to piss power away to the people. Votes? Elections? The voice of the common man? He aired some such notion. I hope you aired the suitable level of contempt. Power for the people? <laughs> sneered Byers. They don't want it. They don't understand it. What the hell would they do with it if they had it? The people are like children. They are children. They need someone to tell them what to do. Someone like you, I suppose. Who better suited? Morovia thought to use me in his petty schemes, and all the while I made good use of him. While he tussled with salt over scraps, the game was already won a move I had prepared some time before. Glockter slowly nodded. Giselle Danluthar. Our oh, little bastard. Your friend and mine. But a bastard is no use unless... Crown Prince Reynold stood in the way. The Magus flicked a piece over, and it rolled slowly from the board and rattled to the table. We talk of great events. There is sure to be some wastage. You made it seem that he was killed by an eater. Oh, he was. Baez watched smugly from the shadows. Not all who break the second law serve Kalul. My apprentice, Yoru Sulfur, has long been partial to a bite or two. And he snapped his two rows of smooth and even teeth together. I see. This is war, Superior. In war, one must make use of every weapon. Restraint is folly. Worse, restraint is cowardice. But only look who I am lecturing. You need no lessons in ruthlessness. No. They cut them into me in the Emperor's prisons, and I have been practicing them ever since. Baez nudged one of the pieces gently forward. A useful man, Sulfur, a man who long ago accepted the demands of necessity and mastered the discipline of taking forms. He was the guard, weeping outside Prince Reynolds' door, the guard who vanished into thin air the next day. A shred of cloth taken from the Emmethrith bedchamber murmured Glockter, blood daubed on his robe. And so an innocent man went to the gallows, and the war between Gurkul and the Union blossomed, 
two obstacles swept neatly away with one sharp flick of the broom. Peace with the Gurkish did not suit my purposes. It was sloppy of Sulphur to leave such blatant clues. But then he never expected you to care about the truth when there was a convenient explanation to hand. Glockter nodded slowly as the shape of things unfolded in his mind. He heard of my investigations from Severard, and I received a charming visit from your walking corpse, Malthith, telling me to halt or die. Exactly so. On other occasions, Yoru took another face and called himself the Tanner, and incited a few peasants to some rather unbecoming behavior. Baez examined his fingernails. All in a good cause, though, superior. To lend glamour to your latest puppet, to make him a favorite with the people, to make him familiar to the nobles, to the clothed council. You were the source of the rumors. Heroic acts in the ruined West? Giselle Dan Luther? Baez snorted. He did little more than whine about the rain. Amazing, the rubbish idiots will believe if you shout it loudly enough. And you rigged the contest, too. You noticed that? Baez's smile grew wider. I am impressed, Superior. I am most impressed. You have fumbled so very close to the truth this whole time. And yet so very far away. I wouldn't feel badly about it. I have many advantages. Salt groped towards the answers in the end, but far too late. I suspected from the first what his plans might be. Which is why you asked me to investigate? The fact that you did not oblige me until the very last moment was the source of some annoyance. Asking nicely might have helped. It would have been refreshing, at least. I regret that I found myself in a difficult position, a case of too many masters. No longer, though, eh? I was almost disappointed when I found out how limited salt studies were. Salt and candles and incantations. How pathetically adolescent. Enough to put a timely end to that would-be Democrat Morovia, perhaps— but nothing to pose the slightest threat to me. Glockter frowned down at the square's board. Salt and Morovia, for all their cleverness, for all their power, their ugly little struggle was an irrelevance. They were small pieces in this game, so small they never even guessed how vast the board truly was. Which makes me what? A speck of dust between the squares, at best. What of the mysterious visitor to your chambers the day I first met you? A visitor to my chambers, too, perhaps. A woman and cold. Angry lines cut across Byers's forehead. A mistake made in my youth. You will speak no more of it. Oh, as you command... And the great prophet Kalul? The war will continue, on different battlefields, with different soldiers. But this will be the last battle fought with the weapons of the past. The magic leaks from the world. The lessons of the old time fade into the darkness of history. A new age dawns. The Magus made a careless movement with one hand, and something flickered into the air, clattered to the center of the board, and spun round and round until it lay flat with the unmistakable sound of falling money. A golden fifty-mark piece, glinting warm and welcoming in the lamplight. Glockter almost laughed. Ah, even now, even here, it always comes down to this. Everything has a price. It was money that bought victory in King Guslav's half-baked Gurkish war, said Byers. It was money that united the open council behind their bastard king. 
It was money that brought Duke Orso rushing to the defense of his daughter and tipped the balance in our favor. All my money. It was money that enabled me to hold the Gothka as long as I did. And you know whose. Who would have thought more first of the moneylenders than first of the magi? Open council and closed, commoners and kings, merchants and torturers, all caught up in a golden web. A web of debts and lies and secrets, each strand plucked in its proper place, played like a harp by a master. And what of poor Superior Glockta, fumbling buffoon? Is there a place for his sour note in this sweet music? Or is the loan of my life about to be called in? I suppose I should congratulate you on a hand well played, muttered Glockta bitterly. Bah! Baez dismissed it with a wave. Forcing a clutch of primitives together under that cretin Harrod and making them act like civilized men— keeping the Union in one piece through the Civil War and bringing that fool Arnold to the throne, guiding that coward Casimir to the conquest of Angland, those were hands well played. This was nothing. I hold all the cards, and always will do. I have... I tire of this. And blah, blah, fucking blah... The stench of self-satisfaction is becoming quite suffocating. If you mean to kill me, blast me to a cinder now and let's be done. But for pity's sake, subject me to no more of your boasting. They sat still for a long moment, gazing at each other in silence across the darkened table. Long enough for Glockter's leg to start trembling for his eye to start blinking, for his toothless mouth to turn dry as the desert. Sweet anticipation. Will it be now? Will it be now? Will it be... Kill you? asked Byers mildly. And rob myself of your winning sense of humor? Not now. Then why reveal your game to me? Because I will soon be leaving, Adua. The Magus leaned forwards, his hard face sliding into the light. Because it is necessary that you understand where the power lies and always will lie. It is necessary that you, unlike Salt, unlike Barovia, have a proper perspective. It is necessary if you are to serve me. To serve you. I would sooner spend two years in the stinking darkness. I would sooner have my leg chopped to mincemeat. I would sooner have my teeth pulled from my head. But since I have done all those things already... You will take the task that Feekt once had. The task that a score of great men bore before him. You will be my representative here in the Union. You will manage the Closed Council, the Open Council, and our mutual friend, the King. You will ensure him heirs. You will maintain stability. In short, you will watch the board while I am gone. But the rest of the Closed Council will never... Those that survive have been spoken to. They all will bow to your authority. Under mine, of course. How will I... I will be in touch. Frequently. Through my people at the bank. Through my apprentice, Sulfur. Through other means. You will know them. I don't suppose I have any choice in the matter. Not unless you can repay the million marks I lent you. Plus interest. Glockter patted at the front of his shirt. Damn it. I left my purse at work then I fear you have no choice. But why would you refuse me? I offer you the chance to help me forge a new age. 
to bury my hands to the elbow in your dirty work. To be a great man, the very greatest of men. To bestride the closed council like a crippled colossus. To leave your likeness set in stone on the king's way where its hideousness can make the children cry, once they clear away the rubble and the corpses, of course, to shape the course of a nation. Under your direction. Naturally. Nothing is free, you know that. Again the Magus flicked his hand, and something clattered, spinning across the squares board. It came to rest in front of Glockter, gold glinting. The arch lector's ring. So many times I bent to kiss this very jewel. Who could have dreamed that I might one day wear it? He picked it up, turned it thoughtfully round and round. And so I finally shake off a dark master, only to find my leash in the fist of another, darker and more powerful by far. But what choice do I have? What choices do any of us truly have? He slid the ring onto his finger. The great stone shone in the lamplight, full of purple sparks. From a dead man to the greatest in the realm, and all in one evening. It fits, murmured Glockter. Of course, your eminence. I always knew it would. Chapter 51 The Wounded West woke with a start and tried to jerk up to sitting. Pain shot up one leg, across his chest, through his right arm, and stayed there, throbbing. He dropped back with a groan and stared at the ceiling. A vaulted stone ceiling covered in thick shadows. Sounds crept at him now from all around. Grunts and whimpers, coughs and sobs, quick gasping, slow growling, the occasional outright shriek of pain, sounds between men and animals. A voice whispered throatily from somewhere to his left, droning endlessly away like a rat scratching at the walls. I can't see! Bloody wet! I can't see! Where am I? Somebody! I can't see! West swallowed, feeling the pain growing worse. In the hospitals in Gurkul, there had been sounds like that when he had come to visit wounded soldiers from his company. He remembered the stink and noise of those horrible tents, the misery of the men in them, and above all, the overpowering desire to leave and be among the healthy. But it was already awfully clear that leaving would not be so easy this time. He was one of the wounded, a different, contemptible, and disgusting species. Horror crept slowly through his body and mingled with the pain. How badly was he injured? Did he have all his limbs still? He tried to move his fingers, wriggle his toes, clenched his teeth as the aching in his arm and leg grew worse. He brought his left hand trembling up before his face, turned it over in the dimness. It seemed intact, at least, but it was the only limb that he could move, and even that was a crushing effort. Panic slithered up his throat and clutched at him. Where am I? Bloody wind! I can't see! Help! Help! Where am I? Fucking shut up! West shouted, but the words died in his dry throat. All that came up was a hollow cough that set his ribs on fire again. Shh! A soft touch on his chest. Just be still. A blurry face swam into view. A woman's face, he thought, with fair hair, but it was hard to focus. He closed his eyes and stopped trying. It hardly seemed to matter that much. He felt something against his lips, the neck of a bottle. He drank too thirstily, spluttered, and felt cold water running down his neck. What happened? he croaked. You were wounded. I know that. I mean, in the city, the wind. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. 
Did we win? I suppose that the Gurkish were driven out, yes, but there are a lot of wounded, a lot of dead. Another swallow of water. This time he managed it without gagging. Who are you? My name is Aris, Dan Casper. Aris. West fumbled with the name. I knew your cousin. Knew him well. A good man. He always used to talk about how beautiful you were. And rich. He muttered, vaguely aware he should not be saying this, but unable to stop his mouth from working. Very rich. He died in the mountains. I know. What are you doing here? Trying to help with the wounded. It would be best for you to sleep now if you... Am I whole? A pause. Yes. Sleep now if you can. Her dark face grew blurry, and West let his eyes close. The noises of agony slowly faded around him. He was whole. All would be well. Someone was sitting next to his bed. Ardy, his sister. He blinked, worked his sour mouth, unsure where he was for a moment. Am I dreaming? She reached forward and dug her nails into his arm. Ah! Painful dream, eh? No, he was forced to admit. This is real. She looked well, far better than the last time he had seen her, that was sure. No blood on her face, for one thing. No look of naked hatred for another. Only a thoughtful frown. He tried to bring himself up to sitting, failed and slumped back down. She did not offer to help. He had not really expected her to. How bad is it? he asked. Nothing too serious, apparently. A broken arm, a few broken ribs, and a leg badly bruised, they tell me. Some cuts on your face that may leave a scar or two. But then I got all the looks in the family anyway. He gave a snort of laughter and winced at the pain across his chest. True enough. The brains, too. Don't feel badly about it. I've used them to make the towering success of my life that you see before you. The kind of achievement that you, as a Lord Marshal of the Union, can only dream of. Don't, he hissed, clamping his good hand across his ribs. It hurts. No less than you deserve. His laughter quickly stuttered out, and they were silent for a moment, looking at each other. Even that much was difficult. Ardy. His voice caught in his sore neck. Can you forgive me? I already did. The first time I heard you were dead. She was trying to smile, he could tell, but she still had that twist of anger to her mouth. Probably she would have liked to dig her nails into his face rather than his arm. He was almost glad then, for a moment, that he was wounded. She had no choice but to be soft with him. It's good that you're not. Dead, that is. She frowned over her shoulder. There was some manner of commotion at one end of the long cellar. Raised voices, the clatter of armoured footsteps. The king! Whoever it was nearly squealed it in their excitement. The king is come again! In the beds all around, men turned their heads, propped themselves up a nervous excitement spread from cot to cot. The king, they whispered, faces anxious and expectant, as though they were privileged to witness a divine visitation. Several figures moved through the shadows at the far end of the hall. West strained to look, but could see little more than metal gleaming in the darkness. The foremost shape stopped beside a wounded man a few beds down. They are treating you well. A voice strangely familiar, strangely different. Yes, sir. Is there anything you need? A kiss from a good woman? I would love to oblige you, but I fear I'm only a king. We're a great deal more common than good women. Men laughed, even though it was not funny. West supposed that people laughing at your poor jokes was one advantage of being a monarch. Anything else? Maybe 
Maybe another blanket, sir. Getting cold down here at night. Of course. The figure jerked his thumb at a man behind. Lord Hoff, West realized now, dragging along at a respectful distance. Another blanket for every man here. The Lord Chamberlain, that fearsome scourge of the audience chamber, humbly nodded his head like a meek child. The king stood and moved into the light. Giselle Dan Luthar, of course. And yet it was hard to believe that it was the same man, and not only because of the rich fur mantle and the golden circlet on his forehead. He seemed taller, handsome still, but no longer boyish. A deep scar on his bearded jaw had given him an air of strength. The sneer of arrogance had become a frown of command. The carefree swagger had become a purposeful stride. He worked his way on slowly down the aisle between the cots, speaking to each man, pressing their hands, giving them thanks, promising them help. No one was overlooked. A cheer for the king! Someone gurgled through gritted teeth. No, no, the cheering should be for you, my brave friends. You! who have made sacrifices in my name. I owe you everything. It was only with your help that the Gurkish were defeated, only with your help that the Union was saved. I do not forget a debt. That I promise you. West stared. Whoever this strange apparition was who looked so like Jezal Dan Luthar, he spoke like a monarch. West almost felt a preposterous desire to drag himself from his bed and kneel. One casualty was trying to do just that as the king passed his bed. Giselle restrained him with a gentle hand on his chest, smiled, and patted his shoulder, as though he had been offering succor to the wounded his entire life, instead of getting drunk in shitholes with the rest of the officers and whining about such meager tasks as he was given. He drew close and saw West lying there. His face lit up, though there was a tooth missing from his smile. Colum West, he said, hastening over. I can honestly say that I have never in my life been so pleased to see your face. Uh, West moved his mouth around a bit, but hardly knew what to say. Giselle turned to his sister. Adi, I hope you are well. Yes. She said nothing else. They stared at each other for a long and intensely awkward moment, not speaking. Lord Hoff frowned at the king, then at West, then at Ardy. He insinuated himself somewhat between the two of them. Your Majesty, we should— Giselle silenced him effortlessly with one raised hand. I trust that you will soon join me in the closed council, West— I'm in some need of a friendly face there, in truth, not to mention good advice. You always were a mine of good advice. I never did thank you for it. Well, I can thank you now. Giselle, I mean, Your Majesty. No, no, always Giselle to you, I hope. You will have a room in the palace, of course. You will have the royal surgeon, everything possible. See to that, please, Hoff. The Lord Chamberlain bowed. Of course, everything will be arranged. Good, good. I'm glad you are well, West. I cannot afford to lose you. The king nodded to him and to his sister. Then he turned and moved on, pressing hands, speaking soft words. A pool of hope seemed to surround him as he passed. Despair crowded in behind it. Smiles faded as he moved away. Men dropped back onto their beds, faces clouding over with pain. Responsibility seems to have improved him, muttered West, almost beyond recognition. How long will it last, do you think? I'd like to think that it could stake, but then I've always been an optimist. That's good. Ardy watched the magnificent new King of the Union striding away, wounded men straining from their cots for the slightest touch of his cloak. That one of us can be. Marshal West! Jalanorm, good to see you.
West pulled back the blankets with his good hand, eased his legs over the edge of the bed, and winced his way up to sitting. The big man reached out and gave his hand a squeeze, clapped him on the shoulder. You're looking well. West smiled weakly. Better every day, Major. How's my army? Fumbling on without you. Croy's holding things together. Not such a bad sort, the general, once you get used to him. If you say so. How many did we lose? Still hard to say. Things are somewhat chaotic. Whole companies missing. Impromptu units still chasing Gurkish stragglers across half the countryside. I don't think we'll have numbers for a while. I don't know if we'll ever get them. No one did well, but the 9th Regiment were the ones fighting at the western end of the Agriant. They took the worst of... He fumbled for the words. It... West grimaced. He remembered that black column of whirling matter reaching from the tortured earth to the circling clouds, the debris lashing at his skin, the screaming of the wind all around him. What was it? I'm damned if I know. Jallenholm shook his head. Damned if anyone does. But the rumour is that this Bias was involved somehow. Half the Agrions in ruins, and they've barely started shifting the rubble. You never saw anything like it, that I promise you. A lot of people dead and all that. Bodies stacked up in the open. Jallenholm took a long breath. And there are more dying every day. A lot of people getting ill. He shuddered. This sickness. Disease. Always a part of war. Not like this. Hundreds of cases now. Some die in a day almost before your eyes. Some take longer. They're withered as skin and bone. They have whole halls full of them. Stinking, hopeless places. But you don't need to worry about that. He shook himself. I have to go. Already? Fly and visit, sir. I'm helping to arrange Polder's funeral, would you believe? He's being buried in state, by order of the king. That is to say, Giselle, Giselle dan Luther. He blew out his cheeks. Strange business. The strangest. All that time, a king's son sitting in the midst of us. I knew there had to be a reason why he was so bloody good at cards. He slapped West on the back again. Good to see you looking so well, sir. Knew they wouldn't be able to keep you down for long. Keep out of trouble, West called after him as he made for the door. Always! The big man grinned as he pulled it shut. West took his stick from the side of the bed, gritted his teeth as he pushed himself up to standing. He hobbled across the expanse of checkered tiles to the window, one painstaking step at a time, and finally stood blinking into the morning sunlight. Looking down on the palace gardens, it was hard to believe that there had been any war that there were any acres of ruins, any heaps of dead. The lawns were neatly trimmed, the gravel well raked. The last few brown leaves had fallen from the trees, leaving the smooth wood black and bare. It had been autumn when he set out for Angland. Could it really have been only a year ago? He had lived through four great battles, a siege, an ambush, a bloody melee. He had witnessed a duel to the death. He had stood at the center of great events. He had survived a slog of hundreds of miles through the bleak Angland winter. He had found new comrades in unlikely places, and he had seen friends dead before his eyes. Burr, Casper, Cathill, Three Trees, all back to the mud, as the Northmen said. He had faced death and he had delivered it. He shifted his aching arm uncomfortably in the sling. He had murdered the heir to the throne of the Union with his own hands. He had risen, by a stroke of chance that verged on the impossible, to one of the highest posts in the nation. Busy year. And now it was over. Peace of a kind. The city was in ruins, and every man had to do his part— but he owed himself a rest. Surely no one would begrudge him that. Perhaps he could insist on Aris Dan Casper to tend him to health. A rich and beautiful nurse seemed like just the thing he needed.
You shouldn't be up. Ardy stood in the doorway. He grinned. It was good to see her. For the last few days they had been close, almost as it had been long ago when they were children. Don't worry, getting stronger every day. She walked across to the window. Oh, yes, in a few weeks' time you'll be as strong as a little girl. Back to bed. She slid one arm under his and took the cane from his hand, started to guide him back across the room. West made no effort to resist. If he was being honest, he was starting to feel tired anyway. We're taking no chances, she was saying. You're all I have, I'm sorry to say, unless you count that other invalid, my good friend Sandan Glockter. West almost snorted with laughter. That worked out. The man is utterly loathsome, of course, in a way, terrifying and pitiful at once. And yet, having had no one else to talk to, I find that I've strangely warmed to him. <laughs> he used to be loathsome in an entirely different way. I've never been sure quite why I warmed to him then, and yet I did. I suppose there's no... He felt a sudden wave of sickness cramp up his guts, stumbled and almost fell, sank onto the bed, stiff legs stretched out in front of him. His vision was blurry, his head spun. He pressed his face into his palms, teeth gritted as spit rushed into his mouth. He felt Ardy's hand on his shoulder. Are you all right? Ah, oh, yes. It's just... I've been having these sick spells. The feeling was already passing. He rubbed at his sore temples, then the back of his skull. He lifted his head and smiled up at her again. I'm sure it's nothing. Colum. There was hair wedged between his fingers. A lot of hair. His own, by the color. He blinked at it, mystified, then coughed with disbelieving laughter. A wet, salty cough from down under his ribs. I know it's been sinning for years, he croaked. But really, this is too much. Adi did not laugh. She was staring at his hands, eyes wide with horror. Chapter 52 Patriotic Duties Glockter winced as he carefully lowered himself into his chair. There was no fanfare to mark the moment when his aching ass touched the hard wood, no round of applause, only a sharp clicking in his burning knee. And yet it is a moment of the greatest significance, and not only for me. The designers of the White Chamber's furniture had ventured beyond austerity and into the realm of profound discomfort. One would have thought they could have stretched to some upholstery for the most powerful men in the realm. Perhaps the intention was to remind the occupants that one should never become too comfortable at the pinnacle of power. He glanced sideways and saw Baez watching him. Well, uncomfortable is about as good as I ever get. Have I not often said so? He winced as he tried to worm his way forwards, the legs of his chair squealing noisily against the floor. Long ago, when I was handsome, young, and promising, I dreamed of one day sitting at this table as a noble Lord Marshal, or a respected High Justice, or even an honourable Lord Chamberlain. Who could ever have suspected, even in their darkest moments— that beautiful Sandan Glockter would one day sit on the closed council as the feared, the abhorred, the all-powerful Archlector of the Inquisition. He could scarcely keep the smile from his toothless mouth as he slumped back against the unyielding wood. Not everyone appeared amused by his sudden elevation, however— King Jezal, in particular, glowered at Glockter with the most profound dislike. Remarkable that you are confirmed already in your position, he snapped. Baez interposed. Such things can happen quickly when there is the will, your majesty. After all, observed Hoff, stealing a rare moment away from his goblet to sweep the table with a melancholy glance, our numbers are most sadly reduced. 
all too true. Several chairs loomed significantly empty. Marshal Verus was missing, presumed dead. Certainly dead, given that he was conducting the defense from the Tower of Chains, a structure now scattered widely over the streets of the city. Farewell, my old fencing master, farewell. High Justice Morovia had also left a vacant seat. No doubt they are still trying to scrape the frozen meat from the walls of his office. Adieu to my third suitor, I fear. Lord Valdis, commander of the Knight's Herald, was not in attendance. Keeping watch on the southern gate, I understand, when the Gurkish detonated their explosive powder. Body never found, nor ever will be, one suspects. Lord Admiral Reutzer, too, was absent. Wounded at sea by a cutlass to the guts, not expected to survive, alas. Truly, the pinnacle of power is less crowded than it used to be. Marshal West could not be with us? asked Lord Chancellor Halleck. He regrets that he cannot. General Croy seemed to pinch off each word with his teeth. He has asked me to take his place and speak for the army. And how is the Marshal? Wounded. And further afflicted by the wasting illness that has recently swept the Agriant? added the king, frowning grimly down the table at the first of the Magi. Regrettable. Baez's face showed not the slightest sign of regret or anything else. A terrible business, lamented Hoff. The physicians are utterly baffled. Few survive. Luther's glare had become positively deadly. Let us ardently hope, gushed Tolacorm, that Marshal West is one of the lucky ones. Let us hope so indeed, although hope changes nothing. To business, then? Wine gurgled from the pitcher as Hoff filled his goblet for the second time since entering the room. How fares the campaign, General Croy? The Gurkish army is utterly routed. We have pursued them towards Keln, where some few managed to flee on the remnant of their fleet. Duke Orso's ships soon put an end to that, however. The Gurkish invasion is over. Victory is ours. And yet he frowns as though he is admitting defeat. Excellent. The nation owes a debt of thanks to its brave soldiers. Our congratulations, General. Croy stared down at the tabletop. The congratulations belong to Marshal West, who gave the orders, and to General Polder and the others, who gave their lives carrying them out. I was no more than an observer. But you played your part, and admirably. Hoff raised his goblet. Given the unfortunate absence of Marshal Verus, I feel confident His Majesty will soon wish to confer a promotion upon you. He glanced towards the king, and Luther grunted his unenthusiastic assent. I am honored to serve in whatever capacity His Majesty should decide, of course. The prisoners are a more urgent matter, however. We have many thousands of them, and no food with which to... We have not enough food for our own soldiers, our own citizens, our own wounded, said Hoff, dabbing at his wet lips. Ransom any men of quality back to the Emperor? suggested Tolacorn. There were precious few men of quality among their entire damn army. Byers frowned down the table. If they are of no value to the Emperor, they are certainly of no value to us. Let them starve. A few men shifted uncomfortably. We are talking of thousands of lives here, began Croy. The gaze of the first of the Magi fell upon him like a great stone and squashed his objections flat. I know what we are talking of, General. Enemies. Invaders. Surely we can find a way, threw in the king. Could we not ship them back to Cantic shores? It would be a shameful epilogue to our victory if each prisoner fed is one citizen that must go hungry. Such is the terrible arithmetic of power. A difficult decision, Your Majesty, but those are the only kind we have in this room. What would your opinion be, Archlector? 
the eyes of the king and the old men in the high chairs all turned towards Glockter. Ah, we know what must be done, and we do not flinch, and so forth. Let the monster pronounce the sentence, so the rest can feel like decent men. I have never been a great admirer of the Gurkish. Glockter shrugged his aching shoulders. Let them starve. King Giselle settled further into his throne with an even grimmer frown. Could it be that our monarch is a touch less housebroken than the first of the Magi would like to believe? Lord Chancellor Halleck cleared his throat. Now that victory is ours, our first concern without question is the clearing of the ruins and the rebuilding of the damage caused by... His eyes shifted nervously sideways to Baez and back. Gurkish aggression. Hear, hear. Rebuilding, we are all agreed. The costs, and Halleck winced as if the word caused him pain, even of clearing the wreckage in the Agriont alone may run to many tens of thousands of marks. The price of rebuilding, many millions. When we consider the extensive damage to the city of Adua besides the costs... Halleck scowled again and rubbed at his ill-shaved jaw with one hand. Difficult even to guess at. We can only do our best, Hoff sadly shook his head, and find one mark at a time. I, for one, for death we look to the nobles, said Glockter. There were several grumbles of agreement. His eminence makes a fine point. A sharp curtailment of the powers of the Open Council, said Halleck. Harsh taxes on those who did not provide material support in the recent war. Excellent. Trim the noble sails, damn parasites. Sweeping reforms. Lands returned to the crown. Levies on inheritance. On inheritance, an inspired notion. The Lord Governors, too, must be brought into the fold. Scald and Mead, yes, they have long enjoyed too much independence. Mead can hardly be blamed. His province is a wreck. This is not a question of blame, said Byers. No, indeed, we all know where that lies. This is a question of control. Victory has given us the opportunity for reform. We need to centralize. Westport as well. Too long they have played us off against the Gurkish. They need us now. Perhaps we should extend the Inquisition to their city, suggested Glockter. A foothold in Styria. We must rebuild. The first of the Magi thumped at the table with one meaty fist. Better and more glorious even than before. The statues in the king's way may have fallen, but they have left space for new ones. A new era of prosperity, said Halleck, eyes shining. A new era of power, said Hoff, raising his goblet. A golden age? Baez looked up the table at Glockter. An age of unity and opportunity for all, said the king. His offering fell somewhat flat, eyes swiveled uncomfortably towards the king's end of the table, quite as if he noisily farted rather than spoke. Um, yes, your majesty, said Hoff. Opportunities. For anyone lucky enough to sit on the closed council, that is. Perhaps heavier taxes on the merchant guilds, proffered Halleck. As our last arch-lector had in mind, the banks also, such a move could produce vast incomes. No, said Byers offhand. Not the guilds, not the banks. The free operation of those noble institutions provides wealth and security to all. The future of the nation lies in commerce. Halleck humbly inclined his head. With more than a hint of fear, do I detect? Of course, Lord Byers, you are right. I freely admit my mistake. The Magus moved smoothly on. 
Perhaps the banks would be willing to extend a loan to the Crown, however. An excellent idea, said Glockter without hesitation. The banking house of Valent and Bulk are a trustworthy and long-founded institution. They were of profound value during my attempts to defend de Gosca. I am sure we could count on their help again. Baez's smile was almost imperceptible. In the meantime, the lands, assets, and titles of the traitor Lord Brock have been requisitioned by the Crown. Their sale will raise a considerable sum. And what of the man himself, Arch Lecter? It would appear he fled the nation along with the last of the Gurkish. We assume that he is still their guest. Their puppet, you mean? Baez sucked at his teeth. Unfortunate. He may continue to be a focus for discontent. Two of his children are under lock and key in the House of Questions, his daughter and one of the sons. An exchange might be possible. Brock! Ha! barked Hoff. He wouldn't swap his own life for the whole world and everything in it. Glockter raised his eyebrows. Then perhaps a demonstration of intent, a clear message that treason will not and will never be tolerated. Never a bad message to send, growled Byers to affirmative mutterings from the old man. A public declaration of Brock's guilt, then, and his responsibility for the ruin of the city of Adua, accompanied by a pair of hangings. A shame for them to have been born to such an ambitious father, but everyone loves a public killing. Does anyone have a preference for a certain day, or— There will be no hangings! The king was frowning levelly at Byers. Hoff blinked. But, your majesty, you cannot allow— There has been enough bloodshed. Far more than enough. Release Lord Brock's children. There were several sharp intakes of breath around the table. Allow them to join their father or remain in the Union as private citizens as they desire. Baez glared balefully from the far end of the room, but the king did not appear intimidated. The war is over. We won. The war never ends, and victory is temporary. I would rather try to heal wounds than deepen them. A wounded enemy is the best kind. They are the easiest to kill. Sometimes mercy buys you more than ruthlessness. Glockter cleared his throat. Sometimes. Though I myself have yet to see the circumstance. Good, said the king, in a voice that brooked no argument. Then it is decided. Have we other pressing business? I need to make a tour of the hospitals, and then once more to clearing the wreckage. Of course, your majesty. Hoff gave a sycophantic bow. Your care for your subjects does you much credit. Giselle stared at him for a moment, then snorted and got up. He had already left the room before most of the old men had struggled to their feet. And I take even longer. When Glockter had finally wrestled his chair out of the way and grimaced to standing, he found Hoff was beside him, a frown on his ruddy face. We have a small problem, he muttered. Indeed, something we cannot raise with the rest of the council? I fear so. Something which, in particular, it would be better not to discuss before His Majesty. Hoff looked quickly over his shoulder, waited for the last of the old men to pull the heavy door shut behind him and leave the two of them unobserved. Secrets, then? How tremendously exciting. Our absent Lord Marshal's sister. Glockter frowned. Oh, dear. Ardy West, what of her? I have it on good authority that she finds herself in a delicate condition. The familiar flurry of twitches ran up the left side of Glockter's face. Is that so? What a shame. You are remarkably well informed about that lady's personal business. 
It is my duty to be so. Hoff leaned close and blasted Glockter with wine-stinking breath as he whispered, When you consider who the father might very well be. And that is? Though I think we both already guess the answer. Who else but the king? hissed Hoff under his breath, a note of panic in his voice. You must be well aware that they were involved in a liaison, to put it delicately, prior to his coronation. It is scarcely a secret. Now this, a bastard child, when the king's own claim to the throne is not of the purest, when he has so many enemies still on the open council, such a child could be used against us if it became known of, and it will, of course. He leaned closer yet. Such a thing would constitute a threat to the state. Indeed, said Glockter icily. All too unfortunately true. What a terrible, terrible shame. Hoff's fat fingers fussed nervously with each other. I realize that you have some association with the lady and her family. I understand entirely if this is one responsibility that you would rather be free of. I can make the arrangements with no... Glockter flashed his craziest grin. Are you implying that I lack sufficient ruthlessness for the murder of a pregnant mother, Lord Chamberlain? His voice bounced loud from the hard white walls, merciless as a knife thrust. Hoff winced, his eyes darting nervously towards the door. I am sure you would not flinch from any patriotic duty. Good. You may rest easy, then. Our mutual friend did not select me for this role because of my soft heart. Anything but. I will deal with the matter. The same small brick-built house in the same unremarkable street that Glockter had visited so often before. The same house where I spent so many enjoyable afternoons, as close as I have come to comfort since I was dragged drooling from the Emperor's prisons. He slid his right hand into his pocket, felt the cold metal brush against his fingertips. Why do I do this? Why? So that drunken asshole Hoff can mop his brow at a calamity averted? So that Giselle Dan Luther can sit a hair more secure on his puppet throne? He twisted his hips one way and then the other until he felt his back click. She deserves so much better. But such is the terrible arithmetic of power. He pushed back the gate, hobbled up to the front door, and gave it a smart knock. It was a moment before the cringing maid answered. Perhaps the one who alerted our court-drunkard Lord Hoff to the unfortunate situation. She showed him through into the over-furnished sitting-room with little more than a mumble, and left him there, staring at a small fire in the small grate. He caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror above the fireplace and frowned. Who is that man, that ruined shell, that shambling corpse? Can you even call it a face? So twisted and so lined, so etched with pain. What is this loathsome, pitiable species? Oh, if there is a god, protect me from this thing. He tried to smile. Savage grooves cut through his corpse-pale skin, the hideous gap in his teeth yawned. The corner of his mouth trembled, his left eye twitched, narrower than the other, rimmed with angry red. The smile seems to promise horrors more surely even than the frown. Has any man ever looked more of a villain? Has any man ever been more of a monster? Could any vestige of humanity possibly remain behind such a mask? How did beautiful Sand Dan Glockta become this? Mirrors, even worse than stairs. His lip curled with disgust as he turned away. Ardy stood in the doorway, watching him in silence. She looked well to his mind 
once he got over the awkward surprise of being observed. Very well, with perhaps the slightest swelling about her stomach already. Three months along now, four perhaps. Soon there will be no disguising it. Your Eminence, she gave him an appraising glance as she stepped into the room. White suits you. Truly? You do not feel it makes the skull like rings about my feverish eyes look all the darker? Why not at all? It perfectly matches your ghoulish pallor. Glockter leered his toothless grin. The very effect I was hoping for. Have you come to take me on another tour of sewers, death and torture? A repeat of that performance will probably never be possible, alas. I seem to have used up all my friends and most of my enemies in that one throw. And regrettably, the Gurkish army can no longer be with us. Busy elsewhere, I understand. He watched her cross to the table, look out of the window towards the street, the daylight glowing through her dark hair down the edge of her cheek. I trust that you are well, she asked. Busier even than the Gurkish. A great deal to do. How is your brother? I have been meaning to visit him, but... But I doubt even I could stand the stink of my own hypocrisy if I did. I cause pain. The easing of it is a foreign tongue to me. Ardy looked at her feet. He is always sick now. Every time I visit, he is thinner. One of his teeth fell out while I was with him. She shrugged her shoulders. It just came out while he was trying to eat. He nearly choked on it. But what can I do? What can anyone? I am truly sorry to hear it. But it changes nothing. I am sure that you are a great help to him. I am sure that there can be no help for him. And how are you? Better than most, I suppose. She gave a long sigh, shook herself, and tried to smile. Will you take some wine? No, but don't let me stop you. I know you never have. But she only held the bottle for a moment, then set it down again. I have been trying to drink less lately. I have always felt that you should. He took a slow step towards her. You feel sick, then, in the mornings? She looked sharply sideways, then swallowed, the thin muscles standing out from her neck. You know, I am the Archlector, he said as he came closer. I am supposed to know everything. Her shoulders sagged, her head dropped, she leaned forwards, both hands on the edge of the table. Glockter could see her eyelids fluttering from the side, blinking back the tears. For all of her anger and her cleverness, she's just as much in need of saving as anyone could be. But there is no one to come to the rescue. There is only me. I suppose I made quite a mess of things, just as my brother said I would, just as you said I would. You must be disappointed. Glockter felt his face twisting. Something like a smile, perhaps, but not much joy in it. I've spent most of my life disappointed, but not in you. It's a hard world. No one gets what they deserve. How long must we drag this out before we find the courage? It will not get any easier to do it. It must be now. Adi. His voice sounded rough in his own ears. He took another limping step, his palm sweaty on the handle of his cane. She looked up at him, wet eyes gleaming, one hand on her stomach. She moved as if to take a step back. A trace of fear, perhaps? And who can blame her? Can it be that she guesses at what is coming? You know that I have always had a great liking and respect for your brother— his mouth was dry, his tongue slurped awkwardly against his empty gums. Now is the time. Over the past month, I have developed a great liking and respect for you. 
A flurry of twitches ran up the side of his face and made a tear leak from his flickering eye. Now, now. Or as close to such feelings as a man like myself can come, at least. Glockter slid his hand into his pocket carefully so she would not notice. He felt the cold metal, the hard, merciless edges brushing against his skin. It must be now. His heart was pounding, his throat so tight that he could barely speak. This is difficult. I am sorry. For what? she said, frowning at him. Now. He lurched towards her, snatching his hand from his pocket. She stumbled back against the table, eyes wide, and they both froze. The ring glittered between them. A colossal, flashing diamond so large it made the thick golden band look flimsy. So large it looks a joke, a fake, an absurd impossibility, the biggest stone that Valent and Bulk had to offer. I have to ask you to marry me, he croaked. The hand that held the ring was trembling like a dry leaf. Put a cleaver in it and it's steady as a rock, but ask me to hold a ring and I nearly wet myself. Courage, Sand, courage. She stared down at the glittering stone, her mouth hanging stupidly open. With shock, with horror, marry this thing? I would rather die. Ah, she muttered. I, I know, I know, I'm as disgusted as you are, but let me speak, please. He stared down at the floor, his mouth twisting as he said the words. I am not stupid enough to pretend that you might ever come to love a man like me, or think of me with anything warmer than pity. This is a question of necessity. You should not flinch from it because of what I am. They know you are carrying the king's child. They, she muttered. Yes, they. The child is a threat to them. You are a threat to them. This way I can protect you. I can give your child legitimacy. It must be our child, now and forever. Still she stared at the ring in silence. Like a prisoner staring horrified upon the instruments and deciding whether to confess. Two awful choices. But which is the worse? There are many things that I can give you. Safety, security, respect. You will have the best of everything. A high place in society, for what such things are worth. No one will dream of laying a finger upon you. No one will dare to talk down to you. People will whisper behind your back, of course, but they will whisper of your beauty your wit, and your surpassing virtue. Glockter narrowed his eyes. I will see to it. She looked up at him and swallowed. And now comes the refusal. My thanks, but I would rather die. I should be honest with you. When I was younger, I did some foolish things. Her mouth twisted. This isn't even the first bastard I've carried. My father threw me down the stairs and I lost it. He nearly killed me. I didn't think that it could happen again. We have all done things we are not proud of. You should hear my confession sometime, or rather, no one ever should. That changes nothing. I promised that I would look to your welfare. I see no other way. Then yes. She took the ring from him without any ceremony and slid it onto her finger. There is nothing to think about, is there? Scarcely the gushing acceptance, the tearful acquiescence, the joyful surrender that one reads of in the storybooks. A reluctant business arrangement, an occasion for sad reflection on all that might have been but is not. Who would have thought? 
she murmured, staring at the jewel on her finger. When I watched you fence with my brother all those years ago, that I would one day wear your ring. You always were the man of my dreams. And now of your nightmares. Life takes strange turns. The circumstances are not quite what anyone would have predicted. And so I save two lives. How much evil can that possibly outweigh? Yet it is something on the right side of the scales, at least. Every man needs something on the right side of the scales. Her dark eyes rolled up to his. Could you not have afforded a bigger stone? Only by raiding the treasury, he croaked. A kiss would be traditional, but under the circumstances. She stepped towards him, lifting one arm. He lurched back, winced at a twinge in his hip. Sorry, somewhat out of practice. If I am to do this, I mean to do it properly. To make the best of it, do you mean? To make something of it anyway. She drew closer still. He had to force himself to stay where he was. She looked into his eyes. She reached up slowly and touched his cheek and set his eyelid flickering. Foolishness! How many women have touched me before? And yet that was another life, another... Her hand slid round his face, her fingertips pressing tight into his jaw. His neck clicked as she pulled him close. He felt her breath warm on his chin. Her lips brushed against his gently and back the other way. He heard her make a soft grunt in her throat, and it made his own breath catch. Pretense, of course. How could any woman want to touch this ruined body, kiss this ruined face? Even I am repulsed at the thought of it. Pretense, and yet I must applaud her for the effort. His left leg trembled, and he had to cling tight to his cane. The breath hissed fast through his nose. Her face was sideways onto his, their mouths locked together, sucking wetly. The tip of her tongue licked at his empty gums. Pretense, of course, what else could it be? And yet she does it so very, very well. Chapter 53 The First Law Pharaoh sat and she stared at her hand, the hand that had held the seed. It looked the same as ever. Yet it felt different, cold still, very cold. She had wrapped it in blankets, she had bathed it in warm water, she had held it near the fire, so near that she had burned herself. Nothing helped. Pharaoh whispered so quiet it could almost have been the wind around the window frame. She jerked to her feet, knife clutched in her fist. She stared into the corners of her room, all empty. She bent down to look under the bed, under the tall cupboard. She tore the hangings out of the way with her free hand. No one. She had known there would be no one. Yet she still heard them. A thumping at the door, and she whipped round again, breath hissing through her teeth. Another dream? Another ghost? More heavy knocks. Come in, she growled. The door opened. Baez. He raised one eyebrow at her knife. You are altogether too fond of blades, Pharaoh. You have no enemies here. She glared at the Magus through narrowed eyes. She was not so sure. What happened in the wind? What happened? Baez shrugged. We won. What were those shapes, those shadows? I saw nothing, aside from Mamun and his hundred words receiving the punishment they deserved. Did you not hear voices? Over the thunder of our victory? I heard nothing. I did. Pharaoh lowered the knife and slid it into her belt. She worked the fingers of her hand, the same and yet changed. I still hear them. And what do they tell you, Pharaoh? They speak of locks and gates and doors and the opening of them. Always they talk of opening them. They ask about the seed. 
Where is it? Safe. Baez gazed blankly at her. Remember, if you truly hear the creatures of the other side, that they are made of lies. They are not alone in that. They asked me to break the first law, just as you did. Open to interpretation. Baez had a proud twist to the corner of his mouth, as if he had achieved something wonderful. I tempered Glustrod's disciplines with the techniques of the Master Maker and used the seed as the engine for my art. The results were... He took a long, satisfied breath. Well, you were there. It was, above all, a triumph of will. You tampered with the seals. You put the world at risk. The tellers of secrets. The first law is a paradox. Whenever you change a thing, you borrow from the world below, and there are always risks. If I have crossed a line, it is a line of scale only. The world is safe, is it not? I make no apologies for the ambition of my vision. They are burying men and women and children in pits for a hundred, just as they did in Alcus. This sickness, it is because of what we did. Is that ambition, then? The size of the graves? Baez gave a dismissive toss of his head. An unexpected side effect. The price of victory, I fear, is the same now as it was in the old time, and always will be. He fixed her with his eye, and there was a threat in it, a challenge. But if I broke the first law, what then? In what court will you have me judged? By what jury? Will you release Ptolemy from the darkness to give evidence? Will you seek out Zacharias to read the charge? Will you drag Corneille from the edge of the world to deliver the verdict? Will you bring great juvens from the land of the dead to pronounce the sentence? I think not. I am first of the Magi, and I am the last authority, and I say... I am righteous. You? No. Yes, Pharaoh. Power makes all things right. That is my first law and my last. That is the only law that I acknowledge. Zacharias warned me, she murmured, thinking of the endless plain, the wild-eyed old man with his circling birds. He told me to run and never stop running. I should have listened to him. To that bloated bladder of self-righteousness? Baez snorted. Perhaps you should have. But that ship has sailed. You waved it away happily from the shore and chose instead to feed your fury. Gladly you fed it. Let us not pretend that I deceived you. You knew we were to walk dark paths. I did not expect... She worked her icy fingers into a trembling fist. This. What did you expect, then? I must confess, I thought you made of harder stuff. Let us leave the philosophizing to those with more time and fewer scores to settle. Guilt and regret and righteousness? It is like talking with the great King Gisal, and who has the patience for that? He turned towards the door. You should stay near me. Perhaps in time Kalul will send other agents. Then I will have need of your talents once again. She snorted. And until then, sit here with the shadows for company? Until then, smile, Pharaoh, if you can remember how. Baez flashed his white grin at her. You have your vengeance. The wind tore around her, rushed around her, full of shadows. She knelt at one end of a screaming tunnel, touching the very sky. The world was thin and brittle as a sheet of glass ready to crack. Beyond it, a bottomless void filled with voices. Let us in. No! She thrashed her way free and struggled up, stood panting on the floor beside her bed, every muscle rigid. But there was no one to fight. Another dream only. Her own fault for letting herself sleep. A long strip of moonlight reached towards her across the tiles. 
The window at its end stood ajar. A cold night breeze washed through and chilled her sweat-beaded skin. She walked to it, frowning, pushed it shut, and slid the bolt. She turned around. A figure stood in the thick shadows beside the door. A one-armed figure swathed in rags. The few pieces of armor still strapped to him were scuffed and gouged. His face was a dusty ruin, torn skin hanging in scraps from white bone. But even so, Pharaoh knew him. Mamun. We meet again, devil blood. His dry voice rustled like old paper. I am dreaming, she hissed. You will wish that you were. He was across the room in a breathless instant, his one hand closed round her throat like a lock snapping shut. Digging my way out of that ruination, one handful of dirt at a time, has given me a hunger. His dry breath tickled at her face. I will make myself a new arm from your flesh, and with it I will strike down Baez and take vengeance for great juvens. The prophet has seen it, and I will turn his vision into truth. He lifted her effortlessly, crushed her back against the wall, her heels kicking against the paneling. The hand squeezed. Her chest heaved, but no air moved inside her neck. She struggled with the fingers, ripped at them with her nails, but they were made of iron, made of stone, tight as a hanged man's collar. She fought and twisted, but he did not shift a hair's breadth. She fiddled with Mamoon's ruined face. Her fingers worked their way into his ripped cheek, tore at the dusty flesh inside, but his eyes did not even blink. It had grown cold in the room. Say your prayers, child, he whispered, broken teeth grinding, and hope that God is merciful. She was growing weaker now. Her lungs were bursting. She tore at him still, but each effort was less. Weaker and weaker. Her arms drooped, her legs dangled, her eyelids were heavy, heavy. All was terrible cold. Now he whispered, breath smoking. He brought her down, opening his mouth, his torn lips sliding back from his splintered teeth. Now! Her finger stabbed into his neck, through his skin and into his dry flesh up to the knuckle. It drove his head away. Her other hand wormed round his, prized it from her throat, bent his fingers backwards. She felt the bones in them snap, crunch, splinter as she dropped to the floor. White frost crept out across the black window panes beside her, squeaked under her bare feet as she twisted Mamoon round and rammed him against the wall, crushed his body into the splintering panels, the cracking plaster. Dust showered down from the force of it. She drove her finger further into his throat, upwards, inwards. It was easy to do it. There was no end to her strength. It came from the other side of the divide. The seed had changed her as it had changed Ptolemy, and there could be no going back. Pharaoh smiled. Take my flesh, would you? You have had your last meal, Mamun. The tip of her fingers slid out between his teeth, met her thumb, and hooked him like a fish. With a jerk of her wrist, she ripped the jawbone from his head and tossed it clattering away. His tongue lolled inside a ragged mass of dusty flesh. Say your prayers, Zita, she hissed, and hope that God is merciful. She clamped her palms around either side of his head. A long squeak came from his nose. His shattered hand poured at her uselessly. His skull bent, then flattened, then burst apart, splinters of bone flying. She let the body fall, dust sliding out across the floor, curling round her feet. Yes. She did not startle. She did not stare. She knew where the voice came from, everywhere and nowhere. She stepped to the window and pulled it open. She jumped through, dropped a dozen strides down to the turf, and stood. The night was full of sounds, but she was silent. 
She padded across the moonlit grass, crunching frozen where her bare feet fell, crept up a long stair and onto the walls. The voices followed her. Wait. The seed. Pharaoh, let us in. She ignored them. An armored man stared out into the night, out towards the house of the Maker, a blacker outline against the black sky. A wedge of darkness over the Agriont within which there were no stars, no moonlit clouds, no light at all. Pharaoh wondered if Ptolemy was lurking in the shadows inside, scratching at its gates. Scratching, scratching forever. She had wasted her chance at vengeance. Pharaoh would not do the same. She slid down the battlements, around the guard, hugging his cloak tight about his shoulders as she passed. Up onto the parapet, and she leapt, the wind rushing against her skin. She cleared the moat, creaking ice spreading out across the water beneath her. The cobbled ground beyond rushed up. Her feet thumped into it, and she rolled over, over, away into the buildings. Her clothes were torn from the fall, but there was no mark on her skin, not so much as a bead of blood. No, Pharaoh. Back and find the seed. It is near him. Bias has it. Bias. Perhaps when she was done in the south, she would return. When she had buried the great Uthman Uldosht in the ruins of his own palace, when she had sent Kalul and his eaters and his priests to hell, perhaps then she would come back and teach the first of the Magi the lesson that he deserved, the lesson that Ptolemy meant to teach him. But then, liar or not, he had kept his word to her in the end. He had given her the means of vengeance. Now she would take it. Pharaoh stole through the silent ruins of the city, quiet and quick as a night breeze, south towards the docks. She would find a way, south across the sea to Gurkul, and then... The voices whispered to her, a thousand voices. They spoke of the gates that Eos closed, and of the seals that Eos put upon them. They begged her to open them. They told her to break them. They told her how, and they commanded her to do it. But Pharaoh only smiled. Let them speak. She had no masters. Chapter 54 Tea and Threats Logan frowned. He frowned at the wide hall and its glittering mirrors and the many powerful people in it. He scowled at the great lords of the Union facing him, two hundred of them or more, sitting in a muttering crowd around the opposite side of the room. Their false talk and their false smiles and their false faces cloyed at him like too much honey. But he felt no better about the folk on his side of the hall, sharing the high platform with him and the great King Giselle. There was the sneering cripple who'd asked all the questions that day in the tower, dressed now all in white. There was a fat man with a face full of broken veins, looked as if he started each day with a bottle. There was a tall, lean bastard in a black breastplate covered in fancy gold, with a soft smile and hard little eyes, as shifty a pack of liars as Logan had ever laid eyes on. But there was one worse than all the rest together. Baez sat with an easy grin on his face, as if everything had turned out just the way he'd planned. Maybe it had. Damn wizard. Logan should have known better than to trust a man with no hair. The spirits had warned him that Magi have their own purposes, but he'd taken no notice, plunged on blindly, hoping for the best, just like always. Say one thing for Logan Ninefingers. Say he never listens. One fault among many. His eyes swiveled the other way towards Giselle. He looked comfortable enough in his kingly robes, golden crown gleaming on his head, golden chair even bigger than the one that Logan was sitting in. His wife sat beside him. She had a frosty pride about her, maybe, but no worse for that. Beautiful as a winter morning. And she had this look on her face when she looked at Giselle, 
a fierce kind of look, as if she could hardly stop herself tearing into him with her teeth. That lucky bastard always seemed to come out all right. She could have had a little bite out of Logan if she'd wanted. But what woman in her right mind did? He frowned most of all at himself in the mirrors opposite, raised up on the high platform beside Giselle and his queen. He looked a sullen and brooding, scarred and fearsome monster beside that beautiful pair. A man made of murder, then swaddled in rich-coloured cloth and rare white furs, set with polished rivets and bright buckles, all topped off with a great golden chain around his shoulders. That same chain that Bethod had worn. His hands stuck from the ends of his fur-trimmed sleeves, marked and brutal, one finger missing, grasping at the arms of his gilded chair. King's clothes, maybe, but killer's hands. He looked like the villain in some old children's story. The ruthless warrior clawed his way to power with fire and steel. Climbed to a throne up a mountain of corpses. Maybe he was that man. He squirmed around, new cloth scratching at his clammy skin. He'd come a long way since he dragged himself out of a river without even a pair of boots to his name. Dragged himself across the high places with nothing but a pot for company. He'd come a long way, but he wasn't sure he hadn't liked himself better before. He'd laughed when he'd heard that Bethod was calling himself a king. Now here he was doing the same, and even worse suited to the job. Say one thing for Logan Ninefingers. Say he's a cunt. Simple as that. And that's not something any man likes to admit about himself. The drunkard Hoff was doing most of the talking. The Lord's Round lies in ruins, alas. For the time being, therefore, until a venue of grandeur suitable for this noble institution has been built, a new Lord's Round, richer and greater than the last, it has been decided that the Open Council will stand in recess. There was a pause. In recess? someone muttered. How will we be heard? Where will the nobles have their voice? The nobles will speak through the closed council. Hoff had that tone a man uses talking down to a child. Or may apply to the undersecretary for audiences to obtain a hearing with the king. But any peasant may do so. Hoff raised his eyebrows. True. A ripple of anger spread out through the lords in front of them. Logan might not have understood too much about politics, but he could recognize one set of men getting stood on by another. Never a nice thing to be part of, but at least he was on the side doing the standing for once. The king and the nation are one and the same, Baez's harsh voice cut over the chatter. You only borrow your lands from him. He regrets that he requires some portion of them back, but such is the spur of necessity. A quarter. The cripple licked at his empty gums with a faint sucking sound. From each one of you. This will not stand, shouted an angry old man in the front row. You think not, Lord Isha? Baez only smiled at him. Those who do not think so may join Lord Brock in dusty exile and surrender all their lands to the crown instead of just a portion. This is an outrage, shouted another man. Always the king has been first among equals, the greatest of nobles, not above them. Our votes brought him to the throne, and we refuse. You dance close to a line, Lord Huygen. The cripple's face twitched with ugly spasms as he frowned across the room. You might wish to remain on that side of it, where it is safe and warm and loyal. The other side will not suit you so well, I think. A long tear ran from his flickering left eye and down his hollow cheek. The surveyor general will be assessing your estates over the coming months. It would be wise for you all to lend him your fullest assistance. A lot of men were on their feet now, scowling, shaking fists. This is outrageous, 
Unprecedented! Unacceptable! We refuse to be intimidated! Giselle sprang from his throne, raising his jeweled sword high, and struck at the platform again and again with the end of the scabbard, filling the room with booming echoes. I am the king! he bellowed at the suddenly silent chamber. I am not offering a choice. I am issuing a royal decree. Adua will be rebuilt and more glorious than ever. This is the price. You have grown too used to a weak crown, my lords. Believe me when I say that those days are now behind us. Baez leaned sideways to mutter in Logan's ear. Surprisingly good at this, isn't he? The lords grumbled, but they sat back down as Giselle spoke on, voice washing around the room with easy confidence, sheathed sword still held firmly in one fist. Those who lent me their wholehearted support in the recent crisis will be exempt. But that list, to your shame, is all too brief. Why, it was friends from outside the borders of the Union who sustained us in our time of need. The man in black swept from his chair. I, Orso of Tallinn, stand always at the side of my royal son and daughter. He seized Giselle's face and kissed both his cheeks. Then he did the same with the queen. Their friends are my friends. He said it with a smile, but the meaning was hard to miss. Their enemies? Ah, you are all clever men. You can guess the rest. I thank you for your part in our deliverance, said Giselle. You have our gratitude. The war between the Union and the North is at an end. The tyrant Bethod is dead, and there is a new order. I am proud to call the man who threw him down my friend, Logan Ninefingers, King of the Northmen. He beamed, holding out his hand. It is fitting that we should stride into this bold new future as brothers. Aye, said Logan, pushing himself painfully up from the chair. Right. He folded Giselle in a hug, slapped him on the back with a thump that echoed round the great chamber. Reckon we'll be staying our side of the white flow from now on, unless my brother has trouble down here, of course. He swept the sullen old men in the front row with a graveyard scowl. Don't make me fucking come back here. He sat down in the big chair and frowned out. The bloody nine might not have known too much about politics, but he knew how to make a threat all right. We won the war! Giselle rattled the golden hilt of his sword, then slid it smoothly back through the clasp on his belt. Now we must win the peace. Well said, your majesty, well said. The red-faced drunkard stood, not giving anyone the chance to get a word in. Then only one order of business remains before the open council stands in recess. He turned with an oily smile and a hand-rubbing bow. Let us offer our thanks to Lord Byers, the first of the Magi, who, by the wisdom of his counsel and the power of his art, drove out the invader and saved the Union. He began to clap. The cripple Glockter joined him, then Duke also. A burly lord in the front row sprang up. Lord Byers! he roared, smashing his fat hands together. Soon the whole hall was resounding with reluctant applause. Even Huygen joined in, even Isha, although he had a look on his face as if he was clapping at his own burial. Logan let his hands stay where they were. If he was honest, he felt a touch sick even being there, sick and angry. He slumped back in his chair and kept on frowning. Giselle watched the great worthies of the Union file unhappily out of the Chamber of Mirrors. Great men, Isha, Barazin, Huygen, and all the rest. Men that he had once gaped at the sight of, all humbled. He could hardly keep the smile from his face as they grumbled their helpless discontent. It felt almost like being a king, until he caught sight of his queen. Therese and her father, the Grand Duke also, were engaged in what appeared to be a heartfelt argument, carried out in expressive Styrian, 
accentuated on both sides by violent hand movements. Giselle might have been relieved that he was not the only family member she appeared to despise, had he not suspected that he was the subject of their argument. He heard a soft scraping behind him, and was mildly disgusted to see the twisted face of his new arch-leptor. Your Majesty, Glockter spoke softly, as if he planned to discuss secrets, frowning towards Therese and her father. Might I ask, is all well between you and the Queen? His voice dropped even lower. I understand that you rarely sleep in the same room. Giselle was on the point of giving the cripple a backhanded blow across the face for his impudence. Then he caught Therese looking at him out of the corner of his eye. That look of utter contempt that was his usual treatment as a husband. He felt his shoulders sag. She can scarcely stand to be in the same country as me, let alone the same bed. The woman's an utter bitch, he snarled, then hung his head and stared down at the floor. What am I to do? Glockter worked his neck to one side, then the other, and Giselle suppressed a shudder as he heard a loud click. Let me speak to the Queen, Your Majesty. I can be quite persuasive when I have the mind. I understand your difficulties. I am myself but recently married. Giselle dreaded to think what manner of monster might have accepted this monster as a husband. Truly? he asked, feigning interest. Who is the lady? I believe that the two of you are distantly acquainted. Ardy is her name, Ardy Dan Glockter. And the cripple's lips slid back to display the sickening hole in his front teeth. But not... My old friend Colum West's sister, yes. Giselle stared, speechless. Glockter gave a stiff bow. I accept your congratulations. He turned away, limped to the edge of the platform, and began to lurch down the steps, leaning heavily on his cane. Giselle could hardly contain his cold shock, his crushing disappointment, his utter horror. He could not conceive of what blackmail that shambling monstrosity might have employed to trap her. Perhaps she had simply been desperate when Giselle abandoned her. Perhaps, with her brother ill, she had been left with nowhere else to turn. Only the other morning in the hospital, the sight of her had tugged at something in him, just the way it used to. He had been thinking to himself that perhaps, one day, with time... Now even such pleasurable fancies were brought crashing to the ground. Ardy was married, and to a man that Giselle despised, a man who sat on his own closed council. To make matters even worse, a man to whom he had, in a moment of madness, just now confessed the total emptiness of his own marriage. He had made himself appear weak, vulnerable, absurd. He cursed bitterly under his breath. It seemed now that he had loved Ardy with an unbearable passion, that they had shared something he would never find again. How could he have not realized it at the time? How could he have allowed it all to fall apart for this? The sad fact was, he supposed, that love on its own was nothing like enough. Logan felt a lurch of disappointment as he opened the door, and close behind it, an ugly wave of anger. The room was empty, neat and clean, as though no one had ever slept there. Pharaoh was gone. Nothing had worked out the way he'd hoped. He should have expected it by now, maybe. After all, things never had before. And yet he kept on pissing into the wind. He was like a man whose door's too low but instead of working out how to duck, keeps on smacking his head into the lintel every day of his miserable life. He wanted to feel sorry for himself, but he knew he deserved no better. A man can't do the things he'd done and hope for happy endings. He strode out into the corridor and down the hallway, his jaw clenched. He shouldered open the next door without knocking. 
The tall windows stood open, sunlight pouring into the airy room, hanging stirring in the breeze. Baez sat in a carved chair in front of one of them, a teacup in his hand. A fawning servant in a velvet jacket was pouring into it from a silver pot, a tray and cups balanced on his outspread fingertips. Ah, the king of the Northmen, called Baez. How art? Where is Pharaoh? Gone. She left something of a mess behind, in fact, but I have tidied up, as I so often find myself. Where? The Magus shrugged. South, I would imagine. Vengeance, or some such, if I was forced to guess. She always said a very great deal about vengeance. A most ill-tempered woman. She has changed. Great events, my friend. None of us are quite the same. Now, will you take tea? The servant pranced forward, silver tray bobbing. Logan seized him by his velvet jacket and flung him across the room. He squealed as he crashed into the wall and sprawled on the carpet, cups clattering around him. Baez raised an eyebrow. A simple no would have sufficed. Shit on that, you old bastard! The first of the Magi frowned. Why, Master Ninefingers, you seem in bullish mood this morning. You are a king now, and it ill becomes you to let your baser passions rule you in this manner. Kings of that sort never last. You have enemies still in the north, Calder and Scale, up in the hills causing trouble, I am sure. Manners should be repaid by like manners, I have always thought. You have been helpful to me, and I can be helpful in return. As you were to Bethod. Just so. Much good it did him. When he had my help, he prospered. Then he became proud and unruly, and demanded things all his own way. Without my help, well, you know the rest. Stay out of my business, wizard. Logan let his hand fall onto the hilt of the Maker's blade. If swords have voices, as the Magus had once told him, he made it give a grim threat now. But Baez's face showed only the slightest trace of annoyance. A lesser man might find himself upset. Did I not buy your life from Bethod? Did I not give you purpose when you had nothing? Did I not take you to the very edge of the world, show you wonders few men have seen? These are poor manners. Why, the very sword with which you threatened me was my gift to you. I had hoped we might come to a— No. I see. Not even we are done. Looks as if I'll never be a better man, but I can try not to be a worse. I can try that much, at least. Baez narrowed his eyes. Well, Master Nine Fingers, you surprise me to the last. I thought you a courageous yet restrained man, a calculating yet compassionate one. I thought you, above all, a realistic man. But the Northmen have ever been prone to petulance. I observe in you now an obstinate streak and a destructive temper. I see the bloody nine at last. I'm happy to disappoint you. Seems we misjudged each other entirely. I took you for a great man. Now I realize my mistake. Logan slowly shook his head. What have you done here? What have I done? Baez snorted with disbelieving laughter. I combined three pure disciplines of magic, and I forged a new one. It seems you do not understand the achievement, Master Nine Fingers, but I forgive you. I realize that book learning has never been your strongest suit. Such a thing has not been contemplated since before the old time, when Aeus split his gifts among his sons. Baez sighed. None will appreciate my greatest achievement, it seems. None except Kalul, perhaps, and it is unlikely he will ever proffer his congratulations. Why, such power has not been released within the circle of the world since, since Glustrod destroyed himself and Alcus with him? The Magus raised his eyebrows. Since you mention it, 
and the results are pretty much the same, it seems to me, except you wrought a touch less careless slaughter and ruined a smaller part of a smaller city in a smaller, meaner time. Otherwise, what's the difference between you and him? I would have thought that was entirely obvious. Baez lifted his teacup, gazing mildly over the rim. Glustrod lost. Logan stood there for a long while, thinking on that. Then he turned and stalked from the room, the servant cringing out of his way. Into the corridor, footsteps clapping from the gilded ceiling, Bethod's heavy chain jingling round his shoulders like laughter in his ear. He probably should have kept the ruthless old bastard on his side. Chances were that Logan would need his help, the way things were like to be in the north once he got back— he probably should have sucked up that stinking piss he called tea and smiled as if it was honey. He probably should have laughed and called Baez old friend so he could come crawling to the great northern library when things turned sour. That would have been the clever thing to do. That would have been the realistic thing. But it was just the way that Logan's father had always said. He'd never been that realistic. Chapter 55 Behind the Throne As soon as he heard the door open, Giselle knew who his visitor must be. He did not even have to look up. Who else would have the temerity to barge into a king's own chambers without so much as knocking? He cursed silently, but with great bitterness. It could only be Baez, his jailer, his chief tormentor, his ever-present shadow the man who had destroyed half the Agriont and made a ruin of beautiful Adua, and now smiled and reveled in the applause as though he were the saviour of the nation. It was enough to make a man sick to the pit of his guts. Giselle ground his teeth, staring out of the window towards the ruins, refusing to turn round. More demands, more compromises, more talk of what had to be done— being the head of state, at least with the first of the Magi at his shoulder, was an endlessly frustrating and disempowering experience. Getting his own way on even the tiniest of issues, an almost impossible struggle. Wherever he looked, he found himself staring directly into the Magus's disapproving frown. He felt like nothing more than a figurehead. A fine-looking, a gilded, a magnificent, yet utterly useless chunk of wood. Except a figurehead at least gets to go at the front of the ship. Your Majesty, came the old man's voice, the usual thin veneer of respect scarcely concealing the hard body of disdain beneath. What now? Giselle finally turned to face him. He was surprised to see that the Magus had shed his robes of state in favour of his old travel-stained coat, the heavy boots he had worn on their ill-fated journey into the ruined west. Going somewhere? asked Giselle, hardly daring even to hope. I am leaving Adua today. Today? It was the most Giselle could do to stop himself leaping in the air and screaming for joy. He felt like a prisoner stepping from his stinking dungeon and into the bright sunlight of freedom. Now he could rebuild the Agriant as he saw fit. He could reorganize the closed council, pick his own advisers perhaps even rid himself of that witch of a wife Baez had saddled him with. He would be free to do the right thing, whatever that was. He would be free to try and find out what the right thing might be, at least. Was he not the High King of the Union, after all? Who would refuse him? We will be sorry to lose you, of course. I can imagine. There are some arrangements that we must make first, however. By all means. Anything if it meant he was rid of the old bastard. I have spoken with your new arch-lector, Glockter. The name alone produced a shiver of revulsion. Have you indeed? A sharp man? He has greatly impressed me. I have asked him to speak in my stead while I am absent from the closed council. Truly? asked Giselle, wondering whether to toss the cripple from his post directly after the Magus left the gates, or to leave it a day. I would recommend, said in very much the tone of an order, that you listen closely to his opinions. 
Oh, I will, of course. The best of luck on your journey back to... I would like you, in fact, to do as he says. A cold knot of anger pressed at Giselle's throat. You would have me, in effect, obey him? Baez's eyes did not deviate from his own. In effect, yes. Giselle was left momentarily speechless. For the Magus to suppose that he could come and go as he pleased, leaving his maimed lackey in charge, above a king in his own kingdom, the overwhelming arrogance of the man. You have taken a high hand of late in my affairs, he snapped. I'm in no mind to trade one overbearing adviser for another. That man will be very useful to you, to us. Decisions will have to be made that you would find difficult. Actions will have to be taken which you would rather not take yourself. People who would live in sparkling palaces need others willing to carry away their ordure, lest it pile up in the polished corridors and one day bury them. All this is simple and obvious. You have not attended to me. No, you are the one who has failed to attend. Sandan Glockter, that crippled bastard! He realized his unfortunate choice of words, but had to forge on regardless, growing angrier than ever. Sitting beside me at the closed council, leering over my shoulder every day of my life, and now you would have him dictate to me? Unacceptable! Insufferable! Impossible! We are no longer in the time of Harold the Great. I have no notion of what causes you to suppose that you could speak to me in such a manner. I am king here, and I refuse to be steered. Baez closed his eyes and drew a slow breath through his nose, quite as though he were trying to find the patience for the education of a moron. You cannot understand what it is to live as long as I have, to know all that I know. You people are dead in the blink of an eye and have to be taught the same old lessons all over again the same lessons that Juvens taught Stolicus a thousand years ago. It becomes extremely tiresome. Giselle's fury was steadily building. I apologize if I bore you. I accept your apology. I was joking. Ah, your wit is so very sharp I hardly noticed I was cut. You mock me! It is easily done. Every man seems a child to me. When you reach my age, you see that history moves in circles. So many times I have guided this nation back from the brink of destruction and on to ever greater glory. And what do I ask in return? A few little sacrifices? If you only understood the sacrifices that I have made on behalf of you cattle... Giselle stabbed one finger furiously towards the window. And what of all those dead? What of all those who have lost everything? Those cattle, as you put it. Are they happy with their sacrifices, do you suppose? What of all those who have suffered from this illness, that still suffer? My own close friend among them. I cannot but notice it seems similar to that illness you described to us in ruined Alcus. I cannot help thinking that your magic might be the cause. The Magus made no effort to deny it. I deal in the momentous. I cannot concern myself with the fate of every peasant. Neither can you. I have tried to teach you this, but it seems you have failed to learn the lesson. You are mistaken. I refuse to learn it. Now was his chance. Now, while he was angry enough for Giselle to step forever from the shadow of the first of the Magi and stand a free man. Baez was poison, and he had to be cut out. You helped me to my throne, and for that I thank you, but I do not care for your brand of government. It smacks of tyranny. Baez narrowed his eyes. Government is tyranny. At its best, it is dressed in pretty colors. Your callous disregard for the lives of my subjects. I will not stand for it. I have moved beyond you. You are no longer wanted here, no longer needed. I will find my own way from now on. He waved Baez away with what he hoped was a regal gesture of dismissal. You may leave. May I indeed. 
the first of the Magi stood in silence for a long time, his frown growing darker and darker, long enough for Giselle's rage to begin to wilt, for his mouth to go dry, for his knees to feel weak. I perceive that I have been far too soft with you, said Baez, each word sharp as a razor cut. I have coddled you like a favorite grandchild, and you have grown willful. A mistake that I shall not make again. A responsible guardian should never be shy with the whip. I am a son of kings, snarled Giselle. I will not... He was doubled over by a spear of pain through his guts, stunningly sudden. He tottered a step or two, scalding vomit spraying from his mouth. He crashed onto his face, scarcely able even to breathe, his crown bouncing off and rolling away into the corner of the room. He had never known agony like it, not a fraction of it. I have no notion of what causes you to suppose that you could speak to me in such a manner, to me, the first of the Magi. Giselle heard Baez's footsteps thumping slowly towards him, voice picking at his ears as he squirmed helplessly in his own sick. Son of kings, I am disappointed after all that we have been through together that you would so readily believe the lies I have spread on your behalf. That nonsense was meant for the idiots in the streets, but it seems that idiots in palaces are lulled by sweet slop just as easily. I bought you from a whore. You cost me six marks. She wanted twenty, but I drive a hard bargain. The words were painful, of course, but far, far worse was the unbearable stabbing that cut up Giselle's spine, that tore at his eyes, burned his skin, seared the very roots of his hair, and made him thrash like a frog in boiling water. I had others waiting, of course. I know better than to trust all to one throw of the dice. Other sons of mysterious parentage ready to step into the role? There was a family called Brint, as I recall, and plenty more besides. But you floated to the top, Giselle, like a turd in the bath. When I crossed that bridge into the Agriant and saw you groan, I knew you were the one. You simply looked right, and you can't teach that. You have even come to speak like a king, which is a bonus I never expected. Giselle moaned and slobbered, unable even to scream. He felt Baez's boot slide under him and kick him over onto his back. The Magus's scowling face loomed down towards him, blurred by tears. But if you insist on being difficult, if you insist on going your own way, well, there are other options. Even kings die unexplained deaths. Thrown by a horse, choked on an olive pit, long falls to the hard, hard cobblestones, or simply found dead in the morning. Life is always short for you insects, but it can be very short for those who are not useful. I made you out of nothing, out of air. With a word, I can unmake you. Baez snapped his fingers, and the sound was like a sword through Giselle's stomach. Like that you can be replaced. The first of the Magi leaned down further. Now, dolt, bastard, son of a whore, consider carefully your answers to these questions. You will do as your arch-lector advises, yes? The cramps relaxed a merciful fraction, enough for Giselle to whisper, Yes. You will be guided by him in all things? Yes. You will abide by his orders, in public and in private? Yes, he gasped. Yes. Good, said the Magus, straightening up, towering over Giselle, as his statue had once towered over the people on the king's way. I knew that you would say so, because, although I know you are arrogant, ignorant, and ungrateful, 
I know this also. You are a coward. Remember that. I trust that this is one lesson you will not ignore. The agony ebbed suddenly away, enough for Giselle to lift his spinning head from the tiles. I hate you, he managed to croak. Baez spluttered with laughter. Hate me? The arrogance of you to suppose that I might care. I, Baez, first apprentice of great Jubans. I, who threw down the master maker, who forged the union, who destroyed the hundred words. The Magus slowly lifted his foot and planted it on the side of Giselle's jaw. I don't care whether you like me, fool. He ground Giselle's face into the vomit-spattered floor with his boot. I care that you obey, and you will, yes? Yes, Giselle slobbered through his squashed mouth. Then, your majesty, I take my leave. Pray that you never give me cause to return. The crushing pressure on his face released, and Giselle heard the Magus's footsteps tap away to the far side of the room. The door creaked open, and then clicked firmly shut. He lay on his back, staring at the ceiling, his breath heaving quickly in and out. After a while, he drew up the courage to roll over, dragged himself dizzily up to his hands and knees. There was an unpleasant stink, and not just from the vomit smeared across his face. He realized with a meager flicker of shame that he had soiled himself. He crawled across to the window, still limp as a wrung-out rag, drew himself gasping up to his knees, and looked down into the chilly gardens. It only took a moment for Baez to come into view, striding down the gravel path between the neat lawns, the back of his bald pate shining. Yoru Sulfur walked behind him, staff in one hand, a box of dark metal held under the other arm. The same box that had followed Giselle and Logan and Pharaoh in a cart across half the circle of the world. What happy days those seemed now. Baez stopped, suddenly, turned, raised his head. He looked up straight towards the window. Giselle pressed himself into the hangings with a whimper of terror, his whole body trembling, the afterimage of that unbearable pain still stamped cold as ice into his guts. The first of the Magi stood there for a moment longer, the faintest hint of a smile on his face. Then he turned away smartly, strode between the bowing knights of the body flanking the gate, and was gone. Giselle knelt there clinging to the curtains like a child to his mother. He thought about how happy he had once been and how little he had realized it. Playing cards, surrounded by friends, a bright future ahead of him. He dragged in a heavy breath, the tightness of tears creeping up his throat, spreading out around his eyes. Never in his life had he felt so alone. Son of kings? He had no one and nothing. He spluttered and sniffed. His vision grew blurry. He shook with hopeless sobs, his scarred lip trembling, the tears dripping down and spattering on the tiles. He wept with pain and fear, with shame and anger, with disappointment and helplessness. But Baez had been right. He was a coward. So most of all, he wept with relief. Chapter 56 Good Men, Evil Men Grey morning time out in the cold, wet gardens, and the dogman was just stood there, thinking about how things used to be better. Stood there in the middle of that circle of brown graves, staring at the turned earth over Harding Grimm. Strange how a man who said so little could leave such a hole. It was a long journey that Dogman had taken the last few years, and a strange one. From nowhere to nowhere, 
and he'd lost a lot of friends along the way. He remembered all those men gone back to the mud, Harding Grimm, Tull Duru Thunderhead, Rudd Three Trees, Forley the Weakest. And what for? Who was better off because of it? All that waste. It was enough to make a man sick to the soles of his boots, even one who was famous for having a flat temper. All gone and left Dogman lonely. The world was a narrower place without him. He heard footsteps through the wet grass. Logan, walking up through the misty rain, breath smoking round his scarred face. Dogman remembered how happy he'd been that night when Logan had stepped into the firelight, still alive. It had seemed like a new beginning, then. A good moment, promising better times. Hadn't quite worked out that way. Strange how the dogman didn't feel so happy at the sight of Logan Nine Fingers no more. The King of the North, man, he muttered. The bloody Nine. How's the day? Wet is how it is. Getting late in the year. Aye, another winter coming. Dogman picked at the hard skin on his palm. They come quicker and quicker. Reckon it's high time I got back to the north, eh? Colder and scale still loose, making mischief, and the dead know what type of trouble Dow's cooked up. Aye, I dare say. High time we left. I want you to stay. Dogman looked up. Eh? Someone needs to talk to the southerners, make a deal. You've always been the best man I knew for talking. Other than Bethot, maybe, but he ain't an option now, is he? What sort of a deal? Might be we'll need their help. There'll be all kind of folk in the north not too keen about the way things have gone. Folk don't want a king, or don't want this one leastways. The union on our side'll be a help. Wouldn't hurt if you brought some weapons back with you, too, when you come. Dogman winced. Weapons, isn't it? Better to have them and not want them than to need them, but I know the rest. What happened to one more fight, then we're done? What happened to making things grow? They might have to grow without us for now. Listen, Dogman, I never looked for a fight, you know that. But you have to be, don't even bother. I'm trying to be a better man here, Dogman. That's so? I don't see you trying that hard. Did you kill Tull? Logan's eyes went narrow. Dal been talking, has he? Never mind who said what. Did you kill the Thunderhead or did you not? Ain't a hard one to come at. It's just a yes or a no. Logan made a kind of snort, like he was about to start laughing or about to start crying, but didn't do either one. I don't know what I did. Don't know? What uses don't know? Is that what you'll say after you've stabbed me through the back while I'm trying to save your worthless life? Logan winced down at the wet grass. Maybe it will be. I don't know. His eyes slid back up to the dogman's and stuck there, hard. But that's the price, ain't it? You know what I am. You could have picked a different man to follow. Dogman watched him go, not knowing what to say, not knowing what to think even, just standing there in the midst of the graves, getting wetter. He felt someone come up beside him, red hat looking off into the rain, watching after Logan's black shape growing fainter and fainter. He shook his head, mouth pursed up tight. I never believed the stories they told about him, about the bloody nine, or bluster, I thought but I believe him now. I heard he killed Crummock's boy in that fight in the mountains, carved him careless as you'd crush a beetle, no reason. That's a man there cares for nothing. No man worse, I reckon, ever, in all the North. Not even Bethod. That's an evil bastard, if ever there was one. That's so! Dogman found he was right up in Red Hat's face and shouting, Well, piss on you, arsehole! Who made you the fucking judge? Just saying is all. Red Hat stared at him. I mean, I thought we had the same thing in mind. Well, we don't. 
You need a mind bigger and a pea to hold something in it, and you're lacking the equipment, idiot. You wouldn't know a good man from an evil if he pissed on you. Red Hat blinked. Right you are. I see I got the wrong notion. He backed off a stride, then walked away through the drizzle, shaking his head. Dogman watched him go, teeth gritted, thinking how he wanted to hit someone, but not sure who. There was no one here but him now, anyway. Him and the dead. But maybe that's what happens once the fighting stops, to a man who knows nothing but fighting. He fights himself. He took a long breath of the cold, wet air, and he frowned down at the earth over Grimm's grave. He wondered if he'd know a good man from an evil any more. He wondered what the difference was. Grey morning time out in the cold, wet gardens, and the dog man was just stood there, thinking about how things used to be better. Chapter 57 not what you wanted. Glockter woke to a shaft of soft sunlight spilling through the hangings and across his wrinkled bedclothes, full of dancing dust motes. He tried to turn over, winced at a click in his neck. Ah, the first spasm of the day. The second was not long coming. It flashed through his left hip as he wrestled his way onto his back and snatched his breath away. The pain crept down his spine, settled in his leg, and stayed there. Ah, he grunted. He tried ever so gently to turn his ankle round to work his knee. The pain instantly grew far worse. Barnum! He dragged the sheet to one side, and the familiar stink of ordure rose up to his nostrils. Nothing like the stench of your own dung to usher in a productive morning. Ah! Barnum! He whimpered and slobbered and clutched at his withered thigh, but nothing helped. The pain grew worse and worse. The fibers started from his wasted flesh like metal cables, toeless foot flopping grotesquely on the end, entirely beyond his control. Barnum! He screamed. Barnum, you fucker! The door! Spit dribbled from his toothless mouth, tears ran down his twitching face, his hands clawed, clutching up fistfuls of brown-stained sheet. He heard hurried footsteps in the corridor, the lock scraping. Locked, you fool! He squealed through his gums, thrashing with pain and anger. The knob turned and the door opened, much to his surprise. What the... Ardy hurried over to the bed. Get out! he hissed, holding one arm pointlessly over his face, clutching at his bedclothes with the other. Get out! No. She tore the sheet away and glocked her grimaced, waiting for her face to go pale, waiting for her to stagger back, one hand across her mouth, eyes wide with shock and disgust. I am married to this shit-daubed monstrosity? She only frowned down for a moment, then took hold of his ruined thigh and pressed her thumbs into it. He gasped and flailed and tried to twist away, but her grip was merciless, two points of agony stabbing right into the midst of his cramping sinews. Ah, you fucking... you... The wasted muscle went suddenly soft, and he went soft with it, dropping back against the mattress. And now, being splattered with my own shit begins to seem just the slightest bit embarrassing. He lay there for a moment, helpless. I didn't want you to see me like this. Too late. You married me, remember? We're one body now. I think I got the better part of that deal. I got my life, didn't I? Hardly the kind of life that most young women hanker for. He watched her, the strip of sunlight wandering back and forth across her darkened face as she moved. I know that I'm not what you wanted in a husband. I always dreamed of a man I could dance with. She looked up and held his eye. But I think 
perhaps, that you suit me better. Dreams are for children. We both are grown-ups. Still, you see now that not dancing is the least of it. You should not have to do this. I want to do it. She took a firm grip on his face and twisted it, somewhat painfully, so he was looking straight into hers. I want to do something. I want to be useful. I want someone to need me. Can you understand that? Glockter swallowed. Yes. Few better. Where's Barnum? I told him he could have the mornings off. I told him I'd be doing this from now on. I've told him to move my bed in here as well. But are you telling me I can't sleep in the same room as my husband? Her hands slid slowly over his withered flesh, gentle but firm, rubbing at the scarred skin, pressing at the ruined muscles. How long ago, since a woman looked at me with anything but horror, since a woman touched me with anything but violence. He lay back, his eyes closed and his mouth open, tears running from his eye and trickling down the sides of his head into the pillow. Almost comfortable. Almost. I don't deserve this, he breathed. No one gets what they deserve. Queen Therese looked down her nose at Glockter as he lurched into her sunny salon without the slightest attempt to hide her utter disgust and contempt. As though she saw a cockroach crawling into her regal presence. But we will see. We know well the path, after all. We have followed it ourselves, and we have dragged so many others after. Pride comes first, then pain. Humility follows hard upon it. Obedience lies just beyond. My name is Glockter. I am the new Archlector of His Majesty's Inquisition. Ah, the cripple, she sneered, with refreshing directness. And why do you disrupt my afternoon? You will find no criminals here. Only Styrian witches. Glockter's eyes flickered to the other woman, standing bolt upright near one of the windows. It is a matter we had better discuss alone. The Countess Chalier has been my friend since birth. There is nothing you can say to me that she cannot hear. The Countess glared at Glockter with a disdain little less piercing than the Queen's. Very well. No delicate way to say it. I doubt that delicacy will serve us here in any case. It has come to my attention, Your Majesty, that you have not been performing your duties as a wife. Therese's long, thin neck seemed to stretch with indignation. How dare you! That is none of your concern! I am afraid that it is. Heirs? For the king, you see, the future of the state, and so forth. This is insufferable! The queen's face was white with fury. The jewel of talons flashes fire indeed. I must eat your repulsive food. I must tolerate your dreadful weather. I must smile at the rambling mutterings of your idiot king. Now I must answer to his grotesque underlings. I am kept prisoner here. Glockter looked round at the beautiful room, the opulent hangings, the gilt furnishings, the fine paintings, the two beautiful women in their beautiful clothes. He dug one tooth sourly into the underside of his tongue. Believe me, this is not what a prison looks like. There are many kinds of prison. I have learned to live with worth, and so have others. You should see what my wife has to put up with. To share my bed with some disgusting bastard, some scarred son of who knows what, to have some stinking, hairy man pawing at me in the night? The queen gave a shiver of revulsion. It is not to be born. Tears shone in her eyes, 
A lady-in-waiting rushed forward, dress rustling, and knelt beside her, putting a comforting hand on her shoulder. Therese reached up, pressed her own hand on top of it. The Queen's companion stared at Glockter with naked hatred. Get out! Out, cripple, and never come back! You have upset Her Majesty! I have a gift for it, muttered Glockter. One reason why I'm so widely hated. He trailed off, frowning. He stared at their two hands on Teresa's shoulder. There was something in that touch. Comforting, soothing, protective. The touch of the committed friend, the trusted confidant, the sisterly companion. But there is more than that. Too familiar, too warm. Almost like the touch of... Ah. You don't have much youth for men, do you? The two women looked up at him together. Then Shalir snatched her hand away from the queen's shoulder. I will have your meaning, barked Therese, but her voice was shrill, almost panicked. I think you know my meaning well enough. And my task is made a great deal easier. Some help here. Two hulking practicals barge through the doors. And as quickly as that, everything is changed. Amazing, the spice that two big men can add to a conversation. Some kinds of power are only tricks of the mind. I learned that well in the Emperor's prisons, and my new master has only reinforced the lesson. You are not there, shrieked Therese, staring at the masked arrivals with wide eyes. You would not dare to touch me. As luck would have it, I doubt it will be necessary, but we will see. He pointed at the Countess. Seize that woman. The two black-masked men tramped across the thick carpet. One moved a chair out of his way with exaggerated care. No! The Queen sprang up, grabbing Shalir's hand in hers. No! Yes, said Glockter. The two women backed away, clinging to each other, Therese in front, shielding the Countess with her body, teeth bared in a warning snarl as the two great shadows approached. One might almost be touched by their evident care for one another, if one was capable of being touched at all. Take her, but no marks on the Queen, if you please. No! screamed Therese. I'll have your heads for this! My father, my father is... On his way to Talins, and I doubt he'll be starting a war over your friend since birth in any case. You are bought and paid for, and Duke also does not strike me as the type to renege on a deal. The two men and the two women lurched around the far end of the room in an ungainly dance. One of the practicals seized the countess by one wrist, dragged her away from the queen's clutching hand, and forced her down onto her knees, twisting her arms behind her, snapping heavy irons shut on her wrists. Therese shrieked, punched, kicked, clawed at the other, but she might as well have vented her fury on a tree. The huge man barely moved, his eyes every bit as emotionless as the mask below them. Glockter found that he was almost smiling as he watched the ugly scene. I may be crippled and hideous and in constant pain, but the humiliation of beautiful women is one pleasure I can still enjoy. I do it now with threats and violence instead of with soft words and entreaties, but still almost as much fun as it ever was. One of the practicals forced a canvas bag over Shalia's head, turning her cries to muffled sobs, then marched her helplessly across the room. The other stayed where he was for a moment, keeping the queen herded into the corner. Then he backed off towards the door. On his way, he picked up the chair he had moved and carefully put it back exactly as he had found it. Curse you! Therese screeched, her clenched fists trembling, as the door clicked shut and left the two of them alone. Curse you, you twisted bastard! If you harm her, it will not come to that, because you have the means of her deliverance well within your grasp. The queen swallowed, chest heaving. What must I do? Fuck.
The word somehow sounded twice as ugly in the beautiful surroundings. And bear children. I will give the Countess seven days in the darkness, unmolested. If, at the end of that time, I do not hear that you have set the king's cock on fire every night, I will introduce her to my practicals. Poor fellows, they get so little exercise. Ten minutes each should do the trick, but there are plenty of them in the House of Questions. I dare say we can keep your childhood friend quite busy night and day. A spasm of horror passed over Therese's face. And why not? This is a low chapter even for me. If I do as you ask, then the Countess will be kept quite safe and sound. Once you are verifiably with child, I will return her to you. Things can be as they are now, during the period of your confinement. Two boys as heirs, two girls to marry off, and we can be done with one another. The king can find his entertainment elsewhere. But that will take years. You could get it done in three or four, if you really ride him hard. And you might find it makes everyone's lives easier if you at least pretend to enjoy it. Pretend? she breathed. The more you seem to like it, the quicker it will be over. The cheapest whore on the docks can squeal for her coppers when the sailors stick her. Are you telling me you cannot squeal for the King of the Union? You offend my patriotic sensibilities. Ah, he gasped, rolling his eyes in a parody of ecstasy. Ah, yes, just there, don't stop. He curled his lip at her. You see, even I can do it. A liar of your experience should have no difficulty. Her teary eyes darted round the room as though she were looking for some way out. But there is none. The noble Archlector Glockter, protector of the Union, great heart of the closed council, paragon of the gentlemanly virtues, displays his flair for politics and diplomacy. He felt some tiny stirring within him as he watched her wretched desperation, some negligible flutter in his guts. Guilt, perhaps, or indigestion? It hardly matters which. I have learned my lesson. Pity never works for me. He took one more slow step forward. Your Majesty, I hope you fully understand the alternative. She nodded and wiped her eyes. Then she proudly raised up her chin. I will do as you ask. Please, I beg of you, do not hurt her. Please. Please, please, please. Many congratulations, your eminence. You have my word. I will see the Countess has only the best of treatment. He licked gently at the sour gaps in his teeth. And you will do the same with your husband. Giselle sat in the darkness. He watched the fire dance in the great hearth, and he thought about what might have been. He thought about it with some bitterness. All the paths his life could have taken, and he had ended up here, alone. He heard hinges creaking. The small door that connected to the Queen's bedchamber crept slowly open. He had never bothered to lock it from his side. He had not foreseen any circumstance under which she would ever want to use it. Some error of etiquette that he had made, no doubt, for which she could not wait even until morning to admonish him. He stood up, quickly, stupidly nervous. Therese stepped through the shadowy doorway. She looked so different that at first he hardly recognized her. Her hair was loose. She wore only her shift. She looked humbly towards the ground, her face in darkness. Her bare feet padded across the boards, across the thick carpet towards the fire. She seemed very young suddenly. Young and small, weak and alone. He watched her mostly confused, somewhat scared, but also, as she came closer and the firelight caught the shape of her body, ever so slightly aroused. 
Therese, my... He fumbled for the word. Darling scarcely seemed to cover it, nor did love. Worst enemy might have, but it hardly would have helped matters. Can I... She cut him off as ever, but not with the tirade he was expecting. I'm sorry for the way that I have treated you, for the things that I have said. You must thank me. There were tears in her eyes, actual tears. He would hardly have believed until that moment that she could cry. He took a hurried step or two towards her, one hand out, no idea of what to do. He had never dared to hope for an apology, and certainly not one so earnestly and honestly delivered. I know, he stuttered. I know. I'm not what you wanted in a husband. I'm sorry for that. But I'm as much a prisoner in this as you are. I only hope that perhaps we can make the best of it. Perhaps we might find a way to care for one another. We have no one else, either of us. Please tell me what I have to do. Shh. She touched one finger to his lips, looking into his eyes, one half of her face glowing orange from the fire, the other half black with shadow. Her fingers worked through his hair and drew him towards her. She kissed him, gently, awkwardly almost, their lips brushing, then pressing clumsily together. He slid one hand round behind her neck, under her ear, his thumb stroking at her smooth cheek. Their mouths worked mechanically, accompanied by the soft squeak of breath in his nose, the gentle squelch of spit moving. Hardly the most passionate kiss he had ever enjoyed, but it was a great deal more than he had ever expected to get from her. There was a pleasant tingling building in his crotch as he pushed his tongue into her mouth. He ran his other palm down her back, feeling the bumps of her spine under his fingers. He grunted softly as he slid his hand over her ass, down the side of her thigh, then up between her legs, the hem of her shift gathering round his wrist. He felt her shudder, felt her flinch, and bite her lip in shock, it seemed, or even in disgust. He jerked his hand back, and they broke apart, both looking at the floor. I'm sorry he muttered, inwardly cursing his eagerness. I... No, it's my fault. I'm not experienced with men. Giselle blinked for a moment, then almost smiled at a surge of relief. Of course. Now everything was clear. She was so assured, so sharp, it had never even occurred to him that she might be a virgin. It was simple fear that made her tremble so, fear of disappointing him. He felt a rush of sympathy. Don't worry, he murmured it softly, stepping forward and taking her in his arms. He felt her stiffen, no doubt with nervousness, and he gently stroked her hair. I can wait. We don't have to. Not yet. No. She said it with a touching determination, looking him fearlessly in the eye. No, we do. She dragged her shift up and over her head, let it drop to the floor. She came close to him, took hold of his wrist, guided it back to her thigh, then upwards. Ah, she whispered, urgent and throaty, her lips brushing his cheek, her breath hot in his ear. Yes, just there. Don't stop. She led him breathless to the bed. If that is all, Glockter looked around the table, but the old men were silent. All waiting for my word. The king was absent again, so he made them wait an unnecessarily long time. Just to stab home to any doubters who is in charge, why not, after all? The purpose of power is not to be gracious. Then this meeting of the closed council is over. They rose, quickly, quietly, and in good order. Torlacorm, Halleck, Croy, and all the rest filed slowly from the room. Glockter himself struggled up, his legs still aching with the memory of the morning's cramps, only to find that the Lord Chamberlain had once again remained behind. 
and he looks far from amused. Huff waited until the door shut before he spoke. Imagine my surprise, he snapped, to hear of your recent marriage. A swift and understated ceremony, Glockter showed the Lord Chamberlain the wreckage of his front teeth. Young love, you understand, brooks no delays. I apologize if the lack of an invitation offended you. An invitation? growled Hoff, frowning mightily. Hardly. This is not what we discussed. Discussed? I believe we have a misunderstanding. Our mutual friend— and Glockter let his eyes move significantly to the empty thirteenth chair at the far end of the table, left me in charge. Me, no other. He deems it necessary that the closed council speak with one voice. From now on, that voice will sound remarkably like mine. Hoff's ruddy face had paled slightly. Of course, but— you are aware, I suppose, that I lived through two years of torture, two years in hell, so I can stand before you now, or lean before you, twisted as an old tree root, a crippled, shambling, wretched mockery of a man, eh, Lord Hoff? Let us be honest with one another. Sometimes I lose control of my own leg, my own eyes, my own face. He snorted. If you can call it a face— my bowels, too, are rebellious. I often wake up daubed in my own shit. I find myself in constant pain, and the memories of everything that I have lost nag at me endlessly. He felt his left eye twitching. Let it twitch. So you can see how, despite my constant efforts to be a man of sunny temper— I find that I despise the world and everything in it, and myself most of all. A regrettable state of affairs for which there is no remedy. The Lord Chamberlain licked his lips uncertainly. You have my sympathy, but I fail to see the relevance. Glockter came suddenly very close, ignoring a spasm up his leg, pressing Hoff back against the table. Your Sympathy is less than worthless, and the relevance is this. Knowing what I am, what I have endured, what I still endure, can you suppose there is anything in this world I fear? Any act I will shrink from? The most unbearable pain of others is at the worst an irritation to me. Glockter jerked even closer, letting his lips work back from his ruined teeth, letting his face tremble and his eye weep. Knowing all that, can you possibly think it wise for a man to stand where you stand now and make threats? Threats against my wife? Against my unborn child? No threat was intended, of, of course. I would never— That simply would not do, Lord Hoff. That simply would not do. At the very slightest breath of violence against them, why, I would not wish you even to imagine the inhuman horror of my response. Closer yet— so close that his spit made a soft mist across Hoff's trembling jowls. I cannot permit any further discussion of this issue. Ever. I cannot permit even the rumor that there might be an issue. Ever. It simply would not do, Lord Hoff, for an eyeless... Tongueless, faceless, fingerless, cockless bag of meat to be occupying your chair on the closed council? He stepped away, grinning his most revolting grin. Why, my Lord Chamberlain, who would drink all the wine?
It was a beautiful autumn day in Adua, and the sun shone pleasantly through the branches of the fragrant fruit trees, casting a dappled shade onto the grass beneath. A pleasing breeze fluttered through the orchard, stirring the crimson mantle of the king as he strode regally around his lawn, and the white coat of his arch-lector, as he hobbled doggedly along at a respectful distance, stooped over his cane. Birds twittered from the trees, and His Majesty's highly polished boots crunched in the gravel and made faint, agreeable echoes against the white buildings of the palace. From the other side of the high walls came the faint sound of distant work, the clanking of picks and hammers, the scraping of earth and the clattering of stone, the faint calls of the carpenters and the masons. These were the most pleasant sounds of all to Gisalzia the sounds of rebuilding. It will take time, of course, he was saying. Of course. Years, perhaps, but much of the rubble is already cleared. The repair of some of the more lightly damaged buildings has already begun. The Agriant will be more glorious than ever before you know it. I have made it my highest priority. Glockter bowed his head even lower. And therefore mine, and that of your clothed council. Might I inquire, he murmured, after the health of your wife, the queen? Giselle worked his mouth. He hardly liked discussing his personal business with this man of all people. But it could not be denied that whatever the cripple had said, there had been a most dramatic improvement. A material change, Giselle shook his head. I find now that she is a woman of almost... Insatiable appetites. I am delighted that my entreaties have had an effect. Oh, they have, they have. Only it, there is still a certain... Giselle waved his hand in the air, searching out the right word. Sadness in her. Sometimes I hear her crying in the night. She stands at the open window and she weeps for hours at a time. Crying, your majesty? Perhaps she is merely homesick. I always suspected she was a much gentler spirit than she appears to be. She is! She is a, a gentle spirit! Giselle thought about it for a moment. Do you know, I think you may be right. Homesick. A plan began to take shape in his mind. Perhaps we should have the gardens of the palace redesigned to give a flavor of talons. We could have the stream altered in the likeness of canals and so forth. Glockter leered his toothless grin. A sublime idea. I shall speak to the royal gardener. Perhaps another brief word with Her Majesty as well, to see if I can staunch her tears. I would appreciate whatever you can do. How is your own wife? He tossed over his shoulder, hoping to change the subject, then realizing he had strayed onto one even more difficult. But Glockter only showed his empty smile again. She is a tremendous comfort to me, Your Majesty. I really don't know how I ever managed without her. They moved on in awkward silence for a moment, then Giselle cleared his throat. I've been thinking, Glockter, about that scheme of mine. You know, about a tax on the banks, perhaps to pay for a new hospital near the docks, for those who cannot afford a surgeon. The common folk have been good to us. They have helped us to power and suffered in our name. A government should offer something to all its people, should it not? The more mean, the more base, the more they need our help. A king is only truly as rich as his poorest subjects, do you not think? Would you have the high justice draw something up? Small to begin with, then we can go further. Free housing, perhaps, for those who find themselves without a home. We should consider— Your Majesty, I have spoken to our mutual friend of this. Giselle stopped dead, a cold feeling creeping up his spine. You have? I fear that I am obliged to. The cripple's tone was that of a servant, but his sunken eyes did not stray from Giselle's for a moment. Our friend is not enthusiastic. Does he rule the Union, or do I? 
but they both knew the answer to that question well enough. You are king, of course. Uh, of course. But our mutual friend, we would not wish to disappoint him. Glockter came a limping step closer, his left eye giving a repulsive flutter. Neither one of us, I am sure, would want to encourage a visit to Adua on his part. Giselle's knees felt suddenly very weak. The faint memory of that awful, unbearable pain nagged at his stomach. No, he croaked. No, of course not. The cripple's voice was only just above a whisper. Perhaps, in time, funds could be found for some small project. Our friend cannot see everything after all, and what he does not see will do no harm. I am sure, between the two of us, quietly, we could do some little good, but not yet. No, you are right, Glockter. You have a fine sense for these things. Do nothing that would cause the least offence. Please inform our friend that his opinions will always be valued above all others. Please tell our good friend that he can rely on me. Will you tell him that, please? I will, Your Majesty. He will be delighted to hear it. Good, murmured Giselle. Good. A chilly breeze had blown up, and he turned back towards the palace, pulling his cloak around him. It was not, in the end, quite so pleasant a day as he had hoped it might be. Chapter 58 Loose Ends a grubby white box with two doors facing each other. The ceiling was too low for comfort, the room too brightly lit by blazing lamps. Damp was creeping out of one corner, and the plaster had erupted with flaking blisters speckled with black mould. Someone had tried to scrub a long bloodstain from the wall, but hadn't tried nearly hard enough. Two huge practicals stood against the wall, their arms folded. One of the chairs at the bolted-down table was empty. Carlot Dan Ida sat in the other. History moves in circles, so they say. How things have changed, and yet how they have stayed the same. Her face was pale with worry. There were dark rings of sleeplessness around her eyes, but she still seemed beautiful. More than ever, in a way the beauty of the candle flame that has almost burned out again. Glockter could hear her scared breathing as he settled himself in the remaining chair, leaned his cane against the scarred tabletop, and frowned into her face. I am still wondering whether, in the next few days, I will receive that letter you spoke of. You know the one. The one you meant for Salt to read the one that lays out the history of my self-indulgent little mercy to you, the one that you made sure will be sent to the Archlector in the event of your death. Will it find its way onto my desk now, do you suppose? A final irony? There was a pause. I realize that I made a grave mistake when I came back and an even worse one when you didn't leave fast enough. I hope you will accept my apology. I only wanted to warn you about the Gurkish. If you could find it in your heart to be merciful... Did you expect me to be merciful once? No, she whispered. Then what, do you suppose, are the chances of my making the same mistake twice? Never come back, I said, not ever. He waved with his hand, and one of the monstrous practicals stepped forward and lifted the lid of his case. No, no, her eyes darted over his instruments and back. You won, you won, of course. I should have been grateful the first time. P please. She leaned forward, looking him in the eyes. Her voice dropped, grew husky. Please, surely there must be something that I can do 
To make up for my foolishness? A peculiar mixture of feigned desire and genuine disgust, fake longing and genuine loathing, and rendered still more distasteful by the edge of mounting terror. It makes me wonder why I was merciful in the first place. Glockter snorted. Must this be embarrassing as well as painful? The effort at seduction leaked quickly away. But I note that the fear is going nowhere. It was joined now by a rising note of desperation. I know that I made a mistake. I was trying to help. Please, I meant you no real harm. I caused you no harm. You know it. He reached out slowly towards the case, watched her horrified eyes follow his white-gloved hand, her voice rising to a squeal of panic. Only tell me what I can do, please! I can help you! I can be useful! Tell me what I can do! Glockter's hand paused on its remorseless journey across the table. He tapped one finger against the wood. The finger on which the arch-lector's ring glittered in the lamplight. Perhaps. There is a way. Anything, she gurgled, teary eyes gleaming. Anything, only name it. You have contacts in talents? She swallowed. In talents? Of, of course. Good. I and some colleagues of mine on the Closed Council are concerned about the role that Grand Duke also means to play in Union politics. Our feeling, our very strong feeling, is that he should stick to bullying Styrians and keep his nose out of our business. He gave a significant pause. How do I... You will go to Talins. You will be my eyes in the city. A traitor, fleeing for her life, friendless and alone, seeking only a place for a new beginning a beautiful yet wretched traitor in desperate need of a strong arm to protect her. You get the idea. I suppose, I suppose that I could do that. Glockter snorted. You had better. I will need money. Your assets have been seized by the Inquisition. Everything? You may have noticed that there is a great deal of rebuilding to do. The king needs every mark he can lay his hands on, and confessed traitors can hardly expect to keep their chattels in such times as these. I have arranged passage for you. When you arrive, make contact with the banking house of Valentin Bulk. They will arrange a loan to get you started. Valentin Bulk? Ida looked even more scared than before, if that was possible. I would rather be in debt to anyone but them. I know the feeling, but it's that or nothing. How will I... A woman of your resourcefulness? I'm sure that you will find a way. He winced as he pushed himself up from his chair. I want to be snowed in by your letters. What happens in the city, what also is about, who he makes war with, who he makes peace with, who are his allies and his enemies. You leave on the next tide. He turned back briefly at the door. I'll be watching. She nodded dumbly, wiping away the tears of relief with the back of one trembling hand. First it is done to us, then we do it to others, then we order it done. Such is the way of things. Are you always drunk by this time in the morning? Your eminence, you wound me, Nicomo Koska grinned. Usually I've been drunk for hours by now. We each find our ways of getting through the day. I should thank you for all your help. The Styrian gave a flamboyant wave of one hand, a hand clock to notice, flashing with a fistful of heavy rings. To hell with the thanks, I have your money. And I think every penny well spent. I hope that you will remain in the city and enjoy Union hospitality for a while longer. 
Do you know, I believe I will. The mercenary scratched thoughtfully at the rash on his neck, leaving red fingernail marks through the flaky skin. At least, until the gold runs out. How quickly can you possibly spend what I have paid you? Oh, you would be amazed. I have wasted ten fortunes in my time and more besides. I look forward to wasting another. Koska slapped his hands down on his thighs, pushed himself up, strolled somewhat unsteadily to the door, and turned with a flourish. Make sure you call on me when you next have a desperate last stand organized. My first letter will bear your name. Then I bid you farewell. Koska swept off his enormous hat and bowed low. Then, with a knowing grin, he stepped through the doorway and was gone. Glockter had moved the Archlector's office to a large hall on the ground floor of the House of Questions. Closer to the real business of the Inquisition, the prisoners. Closer to the questions and the answers. Closer to the truth. And, of course, the real clincher. No stairs. There were well-tended gardens outside the large windows, the faint sound of a fountain splashing beyond the glass. But inside the room there was none of the ugly paraphernalia of power. The walls were plastered and painted simple white. The furniture was hard and functional. The whetstone of discomfort has kept me sharp this long. No reason to let the edge grow dull, simply because I have run out of enemies. New enemies will present themselves before too long. There was some heavy bookcases of dark wood, several leather-covered desks already stacked high with documents requiring his attention. Aside from the great round table with its map of the Union and its pair of bloody nail marks, there was only one item of Salt's furniture that Glockter had brought downstairs with him, the dark painting of bald old Zoller glowered down from above the simple fireplace. Bearing an uncanny resemblance to a certain Magus I once knew. It is fitting, after all, that we maintain the proper perspective. Every man answers to somebody. There was a knocking at the door, and the head of Glockter's secretary appeared at the gap. The Lord Marshals have arrived, Archlector. Show them in. Sometimes, when old friends meet, things are instantly as they were all those years before. The friendship resumes untouched, as though there had been no interruption. Sometimes, but not now. Column West was scarcely recognizable. His hair had fallen out in ugly patches. His face was shrunken, had a yellow tinge about it. His uniform hung slack from his bony shoulders, stained around the collar. He shuffled into the room, bent over in an old man's stoop, leaning heavily on a stick. He looked like nothing so much as a walking corpse. Glockter had expected something of the kind, of course, from what Ardy had told him. But the sick shock of disappointment and horror he felt at the sight still caught him by surprise. Like returning to the happy haunt of one's youth and finding it all in ruins. Deaths. They happen every day. How many lives have I wrecked with my own hands? What makes this one so hard to take? And yet it was. He found himself lurching up from his chair, starting painfully forwards as if to lend some help. Your eminence! West's voice was fragile and jagged as broken glass. He made a weak effort at a smile. Or I suppose I should call you brother. West, Colum, it is good to see you. Good and awful both at once. A cluster of officers followed West into the room. The wonderfully competent Lieutenant Jallenhorm, I remember, of course, but a major now. And Brint, too, made a captain by his friend's swift advancement. Marshal Croy we know and love from the closed council. Congratulations all on your advancement. 
Another man brought up the rear of the party, a lean man with a face horribly burned. But we, of all people, should hardly hold a repulsive disfigurement against him. Each one of them frowned nervously towards West, as though ready to pounce forward if he should slump to the floor. Instead, he shuffled to the round table and sagged trembling into the nearest chair. I should have come to you, said Glockter. I should have come to you far sooner. West made another effort at a smile even more bilious than the last. Several of his teeth were missing. Nonsense. I know how busy you are now, and I'm feeling much better today. Good, good. That is... good. Is there anything that I can get you? What could possibly help? Anything at all? West shook his head. I do not think so. These gentlemen you know, of course, apart from Sergeant Pike. The burned man nodded to him. A pleasure to meet someone even more maimed than myself, always. I hear happy news from my sister. Glockter winced, almost unable to meet his old friend's eye. I should have thought your permission, of course. I surely would have, had there been time. I understand. West's bright eyes were fixed on his. She has explained it all. It is some kind of comfort to know that she'll be well taken care of. On that you can depend. I will see to it. She will never be hurt again. West's gaunt face twisted. Good. Good. He rubbed gently at the side of his face. His fingernails were black, edged with dried blood, as though they were peeling from the flesh beneath. There's always a price to be paid, eh, Sand, for the things we do? Glockter felt his eye twitching. It would seem so. I have lost some of my teeth. I see that, and can sympathize. Soup, I find... I find utterly disgusting. I am scarcely able to walk. I sympathize with that also. Your cane will be your best friend, as it will soon be mine, I think. I am a pitiable shell of what I was. I truly feel your pain. Truly. Almost more keenly than my own. West slowly shook his withered head. How can you stand it? One step at a time, my old friend. Steer clear of stairs where possible, and mirrors always. Wise advice. West coughed, an echoing cough from right down beneath his ribs. He swallowed noisily. I think my time is running out. Surely not. Glockter's hand reached out for a moment, as if to rest on West's shrunken shoulder, as if to offer comfort. He jerked it back awkwardly. It is not suited to the task. West licked at his empty gums. This is how most of us go, isn't it? No final charge. No moment of glory. We just fall slowly apart. Glockter would have liked to say something optimistic. But that rubbish comes from other mouths than mine. Younger, prettier mouths, with all their teeth, perhaps. Those who die on the battlefield are in some ways the lucky few. Forever young, forever glorious. West nodded slowly. Here's to the lucky few, then. His eyes rolled back. He swayed, then slumped sideways. Jallenhorn was the first forward, catching him before he hit the ground. He flopped in the big man's arms, a long string of thin vomit splattering against the floor. Back to the palace, snapped Croy. At once! Brint hurried to swing the doors open, while Jallenhorn and Croy steered west out of the room, draped between them with his arms over their shoulders. His limp shoes scraped against the floor, his piebald head lolling. Glockter watched them go, standing helpless, his toothless mouth half open as if to speak, 
as if to wish his friend good luck or good health or a merry afternoon. None of them seem quite to fit the circumstance, however. The doors clattered shut, and Glockter was left staring at them. His eyelid flickered. He felt wet on his cheek. Not tears of compassion, of course. Not tears of grief. I feel nothing, fear nothing, care for nothing. They cut away the parts of me that could weep in the Emperor's prisons. This can only be salt water and nothing more. Merely a broken reflex in a mutilated face. Farewell, brother. Farewell, my only friend. And farewell to the ghost of beautiful Sandan Glockter, too. Nothing of him remains. All for the best, of course. A man in my position can afford no indulgences. He took a sharp breath and wiped his face with the back of his hand. He limped to his desk, sat, composed himself for a moment, assisted by a sudden twinge in his toeless foot. He turned his attention to his documents. Papers of confession, tasks outstanding, all the tedious business of government. He looked up. A figure had detached itself from the shadows behind one of the high bookcases and now stepped out into the room, arms folded. The man with the burned face who had come in with the officers. In the excitement of their exit, it seemed that he had remained behind. Sergeant Pike, was it? murmured Glockter, frowning. That's the name I've taken. Taken? The scarred face twisted into a mockery of a smile. One even more hideous than my own, if that's possible. Not surprising that you shouldn't recognize me. My first week there was an accident in a forge. Accidents often happen in Angland. Angland? That voice. Something about that voice. Still nothing? Perhaps... If I come closer... He sprang across the room without warning. Glockter was still struggling up from his seat as the man dived across the desk. They tumbled to the floor together in a cloud of flying paper, Glockter underneath, the back of his skull cracking against the stone, his breath all driven out in a long, agonized wheeze. He felt the brush of steel against his neck. Pike's face was no more than a few inches from his, the mottled mass of burns picked out in particularly revolting detail. How about now? he hissed. Anything seem familiar? Glockter felt his left eye flickering as recognition washed over him like a wave of freezing water. Changed, of course, changed utterly and completely, and yet I know him. Ruth, he breathed. None other. Ruth bit off the words with grim satisfaction. You survived, Glockter whispered it, first with amazement, then with mounting amusement. You survived. You're a far harder man than I gave you credit for. Far Far harder. He started to chuckle, tears running down the side of his cheek again. Something funny? Everything. You have to appreciate the irony. I have overcome so many powerful enemies, and it's Salem rules with the knife at my neck. It's always the blade you don't see coming that cuts you deepest, eh? You'll get no deeper cuts than this one. Then cut away, my man. I am ready. Glockter tipped his head back, stretched his neck out, pressing it up against the cold metal. I've been ready for a long time. Rue's fist worked around the grip of his knife. His burned face trembled, eyes narrowing to bright slits in their pink sockets. Now... His mottled lips slid back from his teeth. The sinews in his neck stood out as he made ready to wield the blade. Do it. Glockter's breath hissed quickly in and out, his throat tingling with anticipation. Now, at last, now. But Rue's arm did not move. And yet, you hesitate, 
whispered Glockter through his empty gums. Not out of mercy, of course. Not out of weakness. They froze all that out of you, eh? In Angland? You pause because you realize. In all that time dreaming of killing me, you never thought of what would be next. What will you truly have gained with all your endurance, with all your cunning and your effort? Will you be hunted? Will you be sent back? I can offer you so much more. Rue's melted frown grew even harder. What could you give me after this? Oh, this is nothing. I suffered twice the pain and ten times the humiliation getting up in the morning. A man like you could be very useful to me. A man as hard as you have proved yourself to be. A man who has lost everything, including all his scruples, all his mercy, all his fear. We both have lost everything. We both have survived. I understand you, Ruth, as no one else ever can. Pike is my name now. Of course it is. Let me up, Pike. Slowly the knife slid away from his throat. The man who had been Salem Ruse stood over him, frowning down. Who could ever anticipate the turns that fate can take? Up, then. Easier said than done. Glockter dragged in a few sharp breaths, then growling with a great and painful effort, he rolled over onto all fours. A heroic achievement indeed. He slowly tested his limbs, wincing as his twisted joints clicked. Nothing broken. No more broken than usual, anyway. He reached out and took the handle of his fallen cane between two fingers, dragged it towards him through the scattered papers. He felt the point of the blade pressing into his back. Don't take me for a fool, Glockter. If you try anything... He clutched at the edge of the desk and dragged himself up. You'll cut my liver out and all the rest. Don't worry. I am far too crippled to try anything worse than shit myself. I have something to show you, though. Something that I feel sure you will appreciate. If I'm wrong, well, you can slit my throat a little later. Glockter lurched out of the heavy door of his office, Pike sticking as close to his shoulder as a shadow, the knife kept carefully out of sight. Stay, he snapped at the two practicals in the anteroom, hobbling on past the frowning secretary at the huge desk. Out into the wide hallway, running through the heart of the House of Questions, and Glockter limped faster, cane clicking against the tiles. It hurt him to do it, but he held his head back, gave a cold wrinkle to his lip. Out of the corners of his eyes he saw the clerks, the practicals, the inquisitors, bowing, sliding backwards, clearing away. How they fear me, more than any man in Adua. And with good reason. How things have changed, and yet how they have stayed the same. His leg, his neck, his gums, these things were as they had always been, and always will be, unless I am tortured again, of course. You look well, Glockter tossed over his shoulder. Aside from your hideous facial burns, of course, you lost weight. Starving can do that. Indeed, indeed, I lost a great deal of weight in Gurkul, and not just from the pieces they cut out of me. This way. They turned through a heavy door flanked by frowning practicals past an open gate of iron bars, into a long and windowless corridor, sloping steadily downwards, lit by too few lanterns and filled with slow shadows. The walls were rendered and whitewashed, though none too recently. There was a seedy feel to the place and a smell of damp, just as there always is. 
the clicking of Glockter's cane, the hissing of his breath, the rustling of his white coat, all fell dead on the chill, wet air. Killing me will bring you scant satisfaction, you know. We shall see. I doubt it. I was hardly the one responsible for your little trip northwards. I did the work, perhaps, but others gave the orders. They were not my friends. Glockter snorted. Please, friends are people one pretends to like in order to make life bearable. Men like us have no need of such indulgences. It is our enemies by which we are measured. And here are mine. Sixteen steps confronted him. That old familiar flight. Cut from smooth stone, a little worn towards the centre. Steps, bastard things. If I could torture one man, do you know who it would be? Pike's face was a single, expressionless scar. Well, never mind. Glockter struggled to the bottom without incident, limped on a few more painful strides to a heavy wooden door bound with iron. We are here. Glockter slid a bunch of keys from the pocket of his white coat, flicked through them until he found the right one, unlocked the door, and went in. Arch Lector Salt was not the man he used to be. But then none of us are, quite. His magnificent shock of white hair was plastered greasily to his gaunt skull, dry blood matted in a yellow-brown mass on one side. His piercing blue eyes had lost their commanding sparkle, sunken as they were in deep sockets and rimmed with angry pink. He had been relieved of his clothes, and his sinewy old man's body, somewhat hairy around the shoulders, was smeared with the grime of the cells. He looked, in fact, like nothing so much as a mad old beggar. Can this truly once have been one of the most powerful men in the wide circle of the world? You would never guess. A salutary lesson to us all. The higher you climb, the further there is to fall. Doctor! he snarled, thrashing helplessly, chained to his chair. You treacherous, twisted bastard! Glockter held up his white-gloved hand, the purple stone on his ring of office glinting in the harsh lamplight. I believe your eminence is the proper term of address. You! Salt barked sharp laughter. Arch Lecter! A withered, pitiable husk of a man! You disgust me! Don't give me that. Glockter lowered himself, wincing, into the other chair. Disgust! It's for the innocent! Salt glared up at Pike, looming menacingly over the table, his shadow falling across the polished case containing Glockter's instruments. What is this thing? This is an old friend of ours, Master Salt, but recently returned from the wars in the North and seeking new opportunities. My congratulations! I never believed that you could find an assistant even more hideous than yourself. You are unkind, but thankfully we are not easily offended. Let us call him equally hideous. And just as ruthless, too, I hope. When will be my trial? Trial? Why ever would I want one of those? You are presumed dead, and I have made no effort to deny it. I demand the right to address the Open Council! Salt struggled pointlessly with his chains. I demand... Curse you! I demand a hearing! Glockter snorted. Demand away, but look around you. No one is interested in listening, not even me. We are all far too busy. The Open Council stands in indefinite recess. The closed council is all changed, and you are forgotten. I run things now, more completely than you could ever have dreamed of doing. On the leash of that devil Byers! Correct. Maybe in time I'll work some looseness into his muzzle, just as I did into yours. Enough to get things my own way, who knows? Never! You'll never be free of him! We'll see. 
Glockter shrugged. But there are worse fates than being the first among slaves. Far worse. I have seen them. I have lived them. You fool! We could have been free! No, we couldn't. And freedom is far overrated in any case. We all have our responsibilities. We all owe something to someone. Only the entirely worthless are entirely free. The worthless and the dead. What does it matter now? Salt grimaced down at the table. What does any of it matter? Ask your questions. Oh, we're not here for that. Not this time. Not for questions. Not for truths. Not for confessions. I have my answers already. Then why do I do this? Why? Glockter leaned slowly forwards across the table. We are here for our amusement. Salt stared at him for a moment. Then he shrieked with wild laughter. Amusement? You'll never have your teeth back. You'll never have your leg back. You'll never have your life back. Of course not. But I can take yours. Glockter turned stiffly, slowly, painfully, and he gave a toothless grin. Practical Pike, would you be so good as to show our prisoner the instruments? Pike frowned down at Glockter. He frowned down at Salt. He stood there for a long moment, motionless. Then he stepped forward and lifted the lid of the case. Chapter 59 Does the devil know he is a devil? Elizabeth Maddox Roberts The Beginning The sides of the valley were coated in white snow. The black road ran through it like an old scar, down to the bridge, over the river, up to the gates of Carleon. Black sprouts of sedge, tufts of black grass, black stones poked up through the clean white blanket. The black branches of the trees were each picked out on top with their own line of white. The city was a huddle of white roofs and black walls, crowded in around the hill, pressed into the fork in the black river under a stony grey sky. Logan wondered if this was how Pharaoh Maljin saw the world. Black and white and nothing else. No colors. He wondered where she was now, what she was doing, if she thought about him. Most likely not. Back again. Aye, said Shivers. Back. He hadn't had much to say the whole long ride from Ufrith. They might have saved each other's lives, but conversation was another matter. Logan reckoned he still wasn't Shiver's favorite man, doubted that he ever would be. They rode down in silence, a long file of hard riders beside the black stream no more than an icy trickle. Horses and men snorted out smoke, harness jingled sharp on the cold air. They rode over the bridge, hooves thumping on the hollow wood, onto the gate where Logan had spoken to Bethod. The gate he'd thrown him down from. The grass had grown back, no doubt, in the circle where he'd killed the feared. Then the snow had fallen down and covered it. So it was with all the acts of men in the end, covered over and forgotten. There was no one out to cheer for him, but that was no surprise. The bloody nine arriving was never any cause for celebration, especially not in Carleon. Hadn't turned out too well for anyone the first time he visited nor any of the times after. Folk were no doubt barred into their houses, scared that they'd be the first to get burned alive. He swung down from his horse, left Red Hat and the rest of the boys to see to themselves. He strode up through the cobbled street, up the steep slope towards the gateway of the inner wall, shivers at his shoulder. A couple of carls watched him come, a couple of Dow's boys, rough-looking bastards. One of them gave him a grin with half the teeth missing. The king! he shouted, waving his sword in the air. The bloody nine! shouted the other, rattling his shield. King of the Northmen! He crunched across the quiet courtyard, snow piled up into the corners, over to the high doors of Bethod's great hall. 
he raised his hands and pushed them creaking open. It wasn't much warmer inside than out in the snow. The high windows were open at the far end, the noise of the cold, cold river roaring from far below. Scarling's chair stood on its raised-up platform at the top of the steps, casting a long shadow across the rough floorboards towards him. Someone was sitting in it, Logan realized, as his eyes got used to the dark. Black Dow. His axe and his sword leaned up against the side of the chair, the glint of sharpened metal in the darkness. Just like him, that. Always kept his weapons close to hand. Logan grinned at him. Getting comfortable, Dow. Bit hard on the arse, being honest, but it's better than dirt for sitting in. Did you find Calder and Scale? I, I found them. Dead then, are they? Not yet. Thought I'd try something different. We've been talking. Talking, is it? To those two bastards. I can think of worse. Where's the dogman at? Still back there trading words with the Union, sorting out an understanding. Grim? Logan shook his head. Back to the mud. Ah. Well, there it is. Makes this easier anyway. Dow's eyes flickered sideways. Makes what easier? Logan looked round. Shivers was standing right at his shoulder, scowling as if he had someone's murder in mind. No need to ask whose. Steel gleamed beside him in the shadows, a blade out and ready. He could have stabbed Logan in the back with time to spare. But he hadn't done, and he didn't now. It seemed as if they all stayed still for quite a while, frozen as the cold valley out beyond the windows. Shit on this! Shivers tossed the knife away, clattering across the floor. I'm better than you, bloody nine. I'm better than the pair of you. You can get your own work done, Black Dow. I'm done with it. He turned round and strode out, shoving his way past the two carls from the gate, just now coming the other way. One of them hefted his shield as he frowned at Logan. The other one pulled the doors shut, swung the bar down with a final-sounding clunk. Logan slid the maker's sword out of its sheath, turned his head, and spat on the boards. Like that, is it? Course it is, said Dow, still sat in Scarling's chair. If you'd ever looked a stride further than the end of your nose, you'd know it. What about the old ways, eh? What about your word? The old ways are gone. You killed them, you and Befod. Men's words ain't worth much these days. Well then, he called over his shoulder, now's your chance, ain't it? Logan felt the moment. A lucky choice, maybe, but he'd always had plenty of luck, good and bad. He dived sideways, heard the rattle of the flat bow at the same moment, rolled across the floor, and came up in a crouch as the bolt clattered against the wall behind him. He saw a figure in the dark now, kneeling up at the far end of the hall. Calder. Logan heard his curse, fishing for another bolt. Bloody nine, you broken dog! Scale came pounding out of the shadows, boots battering the floorboards, an axe in his great fists with a blade big as a cartwheel. Here's your death! Logan stayed where he was, crouching loose and ready, and he felt himself smile. The odds were against him, maybe, but that was nothing new. It was almost a relief not to have to think. Fine words and politics, none of that meant anything to him. But this, this he understood. The blade crashed into the boards, sent splinters flying. Logan had already rolled out of the way. Now he backed off, watching, moving, letting scale cleave the air around him. The air healed quick, after all. The next blow flashed sideways, and Logan dodged back, let it chop a great lump of plaster from the wall. He stepped in closer as Scale snarled again, his furious little eyes bulging, ready to swing his axe round in a blow to split the world. The pommel of the Maker's sword crunched into his mouth before he got the chance, jerked his head up, spots of black blood and a chunk of white tooth flying. He staggered back, and Logan followed him. Scale's eyes rolled down, axe going up high, opening his bloody mouth to make another bellow. Logan's boot rammed hard into the side of his leg. 
His knee bent back the wrong way with a sharp pop, and he dropped to the boards, axe flying from his hands, his roar turning to a shriek of pain. My knee! Ah, oh, fuck! My knee! He thrashed on the floor, blood running down his chin, trying to kick his way back with only one good leg. Logan laughed at him. You bloated pig! I warned you, didn't I? By the fucking dead! barked Dow. He sprang up out of Scarling's chair, axe and sword in his hands. If you want a thing done fucking right, you'd best get ready to set your own hand to it. Logan would have liked to stab Scale right through his fat head, but there were too many other men needed watching. The two Carls were still standing by the door. Calder was loading up his next bolt. Logan sidled into space, trying to keep his eye on all of them at once, and Dow most of all. Aye, you faithless bastard, he shouted. Let's have you. Faithless? Me? Dow snorted as he came on slow down the steps, one at a time. I'm a dark bastard, I. I know what I am, but I'm nothing to you. I know my friends from my enemies. I never killed me own. Bethob was right about one thing, bloody nine. You're made of death. If I can put an end to you, do you know what? That'll be the best thing I've done in my life. That all? Dow showed his teeth. That, and I'm just plain sick of taking your fucking say-so. He came on fast as a snake, axe swinging over, sword flashing across waist-high. Logan dodged the axe, met the blade with his own, metal clanging on metal. Dow caught him in his sore ribs with his knee and sent him gasping back towards the wall, then came at him again, blades leaving bright traces in the darkness. Logan sprang out of the way, rolled and came up, strutting out into the middle of the hall again, sword hanging loose from his hand. That it? he asked, smiling through the pain in his side. Just getting the blood flow in. Dow leapt forward, made to go right, and came left instead, sword and axe sweeping down together. Logan saw them coming, weaved away from the axe, turned the sword off his own, and stepped in, growling. Dow jerked back as the maker's blade hissed through the air right in front of his face, stumbled away a step or two. His eye twitched, some red leaking down his cheek from a nick just under it. Logan grinned, spun the grip of his sword round in his hand. Blood's flowing now, eh? I. Dow gave a grin of his own. Just like old times. I should have killed you then. Damn right you should have. Dow circled round him, always moving, weapons gleaming in the cold light from the tall windows. But you love to play the good man, don't you? Do you know what's worse than a villain? A villain who thinks he's a hero. A man like that. There's nothing he won't do, and he'll always find himself an excuse. We've had one ruthless bastard make himself king of the north, and I'll be damned before I see a worse. He fainted forward, and Logan jerked back. He heard the click of Calder's flatbow again, and saw the bolt flash right between them. Dow scowled over at him. You trying to kill me? You loose another bolt and you're spitted, you hear? Stop pissing around and kill him, then! snapped Calder, cranking away at his flatbow. Kill him! bellowed Scale from somewhere in the shadows. I'm working at it, pig! Dow jerked his head at the two Carls by the door. You two gonna pitch in, or what? They looked at each other, none too keen. Then they came forward into the hall, their round shields up, their eyes on Logan, herding him towards one corner. Logan bared his teeth as he backed off. That's how you'll get it done, is it? I'd rather kill you fair, but kill you crooked? Dow shrugged his shoulders. Just as good. I ain't in the business of giving chances. Go on in, at him! The two of them closed in, cautious, Dow moving off to the side. Logan scrambled back, trying to look scared and waiting for some kind of chance. It wasn't long coming. One of the Carls stepped a touch too close, let his shield drop low. He chose a bad moment to raise his axe, and a bad way to do it. There was a click as the maker's sword took his forearm off, left it hanging from his elbow by a scrap of chainmail. 
He stumbled forward, dragging in a great wheezing breath, making ready to scream, blood spurting out of the stump of his arm and splattering on the boards. Logan chopped a great gash out of his helmet, and he dropped down on his knees. Gwah! he muttered, blood pouring down the side of his face. His eyes rolled up to the ceiling, and he flopped on his side. The other Carl jumped over his body, roaring at the top of his lungs. Logan caught his sword, their blades scraping together, then he barged into the man's shield with his shoulder, sent him sprawling on his ass. He gave a wail, the Carl, one boot sticking up. Logan swung the maker's sword down and split that foot in half up to his ankle. Quick footsteps came up under the Carl's shriek. Logan spun, saw Black Dowd charging at him, face crushed up into a killing grin. Die! he hissed. Logan lurched away, the blade just missing him on one side, the axe on the other. He tried to swing the maker's sword, but Dow was too quick and too clever, shoved Logan back with his boot and sent him staggering. Die, bloody nine! Logan dodged, parried, stumbled, as Dow came on again, no pauses and no mercy. Steel glinted in the darkness, blades lashing, killing blows every one. Die, you evil fucker! Dow's sword chopped down, and Logan only just brought his own round in time to block it. The axe came out of nowhere, up from underneath, clattered into the crosspiece, and tore Logan's blade spinning from his numb hand. He wobbled back a couple of strides and stood heaving in air, sweat tickling at his neck. It was quite a scrape he was in. He'd been in some bad ones all right and lived to sing the songs, but it was hard to see how this could get much worse. Logan nodded towards the maker's sword, lying on the boards just next to Dow's boot. <sighs> Don't suppose you fancy giving a man a fair chance and letting me have that blade, eh? Dow grinned wider than ever. What's my name? White Dow? Logan had a knife to hand, of course. He always did, and more than one. His eyes flickered from the notched blade of Dow's sword to the glinting edge of his axe and back. No amount of knives were going to be a match for those, not in Black Dow's hands. Then there was Calder's flatbow, still rattling away as he tried to load the bastard thing again. He wouldn't miss forever. The Carl with the split foot was dragging himself squealing towards the door, on his way to let some more men in and finish the job. If Logan stood and fought, he was a dead man, bloody nine or not. So it came to a choice between dying and a chance at living, and that's no choice at all. Once you know what has to be done, it's better to do it than to live with the fear of it. That's what Logan's father would have said. So he turned towards the tall windows, the tall, open windows with the bright white sunlight and the cold wind pouring through, and he ran at them. He heard men shouting behind, but he paid them no mind. He kept running, breath hissing, long strips of light wobbling closer. He was up the steps in a couple of bounds, flashed past Scarling's chair, faster and faster. His right foot clomped down on the hollow floorboards. His left foot slapped down on the stone windowsill. He sprang out into empty space with all the strength he had left, and for a moment he was free. Then he began to fall. Fast. The rough walls, then the steep cliff face flashed past, grey rock, green moss, patches of white snow, all tumbling around him. Logan turned over slowly in the air, limbs flailing pointlessly, too scared to scream. The rushing wind whipped at his eyes, tugged at his clothes, plucked the breath out of his mouth. He'd chosen this? Didn't seem like such a clever choice right then, as he plunged down towards the river. But then, say one thing for Logan Nine Fingers, say that the water came up to meet him. It hit him in the side like a charging bull, punched the air out of his lungs, knocked the sense out of his head, sucked him in, and down into the cold darkness.
Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.